the sports breakfast show from off the ball what a moment for the republic of ireland off the ball supporting the girls in green down under this summer it has been a fight a fight every step of the way for so many irish women over the last half a century when it came to irish football i'm honestly speechless i mean we're going to a world cup but it's what dreams are made of counting down to more moments like this lily Ives scores one of the most important goals they have ever scored i hope someone's got the champagne on i didn't know what i've just done i don't know what we've just done barrett for ireland into the area toe push it go and when you think back to Liberty Hall in 2019 and the stand that was taken by the woman beside me and so many players out on that pitch, it changed the course of Irish football history. I can't believe it. We finally done. 82,000 people, that's going to be something else. There'll be a hell of a lot of Irish in that, and it'll be a hell of a game as well. They are going to the World Cup Finals! Yeah, Yeah, let's go straight to Australia. Kathy McNamee, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are we? Oh, totes emotion now. I know. Emma sent me that as a little preview. She was like, if I send it to you beforehand, you may not cry live on air. Uh, what a day. You can see behind me the stadium just before we came on air. I could hear the band inside practicing around Naveen. It's a whole song. And I was standing here and I had like a little moment of just being like, wow, this this is really happening. We're really here. We are mere hours away from kickoff. We've got all the excitement and all the build up and brought us here. Uh, have you bumped into people today? Are you seeing people? What's your sense of how much of a takeover we might be able to affect? Uh, definitely Central Sydney was majority made up of Irish people today when I was wandering around. Uh, I was over at Sydney Opera House and I was chatting to fans. There was one woman who convinced 17 members of her family to fly over from Connemara. She's been based here for a couple of years. Other people are just getting in yesterday morning. I was over at one of the big Irish pubs, uh, the Mercantile, and that was absolutely popping. It was funny, I went there last night and it was very quiet, there wasn't really anyone around. And then today they had massive screens outside, everyone was singing, there was chanting. It was just a really, really good vibe, everyone was really excited. A lot of people who are based in Australia, but maybe not Sydney, Um, so a lot of people had flown from Melbourne, some would come from Perth, some would come from Adelaide. And yeah, it's re- here at the moment, actually, I have to say there isn't all that many Irish people and I suspect it is because they're probably still enjoying the pubs and the life that Sydney has to offer. Maybe in the next couple of hours, we'll see a few more of them. It's mostly Matildas, but definitely from what I've seen around Sydney, there's going to be a lot of people today. How's the weather, Kathleen? Is this going to suit us? Uh, the weather is nice at the moment. It's been very warm all day and then... Uh, in the night it tends to get quite cold so it was quite similar yesterday it was freezing by the time it hit 8 o'clock so and nothing that we aren't going to be too used to I think we'll be alright I just got some Irish fans giving me a big thumbs up here as they watch by as well bring them over there <laughs> bring, them, bring them all over um, so they're streaming in now so it's a nice colour contrast green versus yellow it's going to stand out a mile we'll be able to do the counter afterwards Gavin Kolsky yeah, reporting this morning, it, Kathleen, about 75,000 expected rather than the 83,000. Uh, do you have any idea of the breakdown? Yeah, that, uh, from what I've heard, I think it's probably going to be like pretty much they expect around 25,000 Irish. And really? that's not, that's including obviously, but that's including people who are over here already. So like people who are kind of like have bought tickets through clubs and stuff. Yeah. You know, like I've met so many people who are, you know, Irish living here who have like either got family to come over for this in particular or have literally gathered all their friends together no matter what part of Australia they're in treating this as like almost a massive St. Patrick's Day party and an opportunity to like gather get together and really enjoy it so that was the upper figure that I was quoted it could be I'd say it's probably closer to maybe like eight, seventeen, eighteen thousand, 18,000 but you never know well, all very capable of making a lot of noise. And uh, cause, uh, like um, in New York in 94, one of the big things was this kind of uh, intake of breath from the team when they got out and they were like, hang on a second, we've taken over the stadium, giant stadium. So if we could have a similar moment like that in advance of kickoff where suddenly the Australians are like, oh, this, uh, this is not what I expected. That might be a little bit helpful. Yeah. Because Look, it, it's been, as we've been talking about, uh, it has been quite the roller coaster. And, you know, for the last couple of days, people have been like, oh, no, what's going to happen here? This could go pear-shaped. And then the day is here. We have the 
stupidity of fans we're like actually you know what maybe we'll, we'll do the yeah. prize today <laughs> There was a lot of optimism around the place whenever I was speaking to people. And like, in fairness, these are the hours where you sink into your optimism, you sink into the history that you're witnessing, you sink into the absolute joy and pleasure that it is getting to see people so far away from home celebrate all the great things that it means to be Irish and celebrate this team as well. I mean, you know, people, you know, it was quite funny when I was at the Irish pub, I was kind of just like standing outside their outdoor area then really like hadn't said anything and I was going to go up and ask a few people for an interview and pulled out the off the ball mic and it was so funny it was like an instant reaction everyone was like off the ball is here off the ball here I want to go on off the ball and like these a lot of the people have been over here for anything between two years to ten years but having that connection to home they're they automatically are like hi come on I want to like chat to the lads um, I also very funnily ran into a lot of Monaghan people including our very own Shane Hannon coach who dropped him as captain who was over here at the oh, moment right. I don't think he even told Shane he was coming uh, but yeah this Monaghan man just came up to me and said he's captain and I was like yes who are you and he's like oh, I'm best friends with Shane Hannon so there you go I know he's not there today I was like very upset I was like perfect opportunity to bring Monaghan literally everywhere we go but you cannot escape it wait now Kathleen did you say he's best friends with Shane Hannon but he also dropped him as captain that's what he told me so I don't know um, what the vibe actually was between the two of them but uh, yeah so they're very close so what's good Shane's taking this in an hour's time from down the country e- ex-best friend yeah exactly uh, yeah. <laughs> so apart from our expectation there, the atmosphere is going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, tell us what has the last 24 hours given you in terms of your thinking about how the game will go and what we should expect in terms of game flow. Like we were previewing the game yesterday and uh, the Australians are a world-class counter-attacking team. There's not going to be too much counter-attacking that they're doing in terms of they will control possession, they will control the flow of the game today. And maybe the low block is the thing that will frustrate them. Well, I think if you look at even what a lot of the international media are taking our green glasses off are saying is that this Irish team will probably frustrate Australia for a while, but that eventually Australia may crack us. I'm still slightly pessimistic about today. I've been predicting a 3-1 result for Australia. I think we can hold out for a little while, but I do think that the Australian team, as you say, is just, they have that little bit of edge and skill and quality that I don't know do we have in depth in our team. Um, I do think they are a little overconfident coming into the game, considering like how they performed in say the Lincoln Cup, which was like less than a year ago. So I hope you can hear all the little Matilda fans behind me screaming and having getting their Aussie tears in. Uh, so yeah, I think it's going to be a really tough day. Um, the team seemed to have been preparing nicely. They went for a wander around Sydney Harbour earlier, and then I heard that a few of the other ones were just kind of chilling among themselves and just making sure that they were enjoying and soaking up the atmosphere but also not letting it get to them too much so tomorrow or tonight is going to be very interesting I mean I walked out onto the pitch yesterday and I was like whoa (laughs) this is a lot bigger than I expected Um, so hopefully them being able to walk around the pitch tomorrow last night means that they're not too overawed by it when it comes to it not to get like too analytical now because we're in a party mode here but like Australia's form this year Kathleen beating England, Spain, Sweden scoring 26 conceding just 5 you say you have an air of pessimism around you maybe a 3-1 defeat like day of the game what do you think Ireland can do or need to do to upset that prediction Um, realistically I I suppose I think it's going to be I think realistically it is going to be that low block. I think it's going to be making sure that we are defensively completely solid. I think we need to make sure we don't just focus on Sam Kerr because there are so many attacking threats in that team. Um, and also taking our chances when they come. One of the things that we talk about with this team so much is like, where where are the goals going to come from? Where are we going to get the scores? So whether it's a set piece or whether it's a break and play where we manage to counter ourselves, we need to make sure that we are clinical in all those situations if we're ever going to get out of here with the results. Uh, okay, you, you mentioned that there were you caught up with some fans. We have some of the the, uh, the video of that. Just an average Friday night out in Sydney. See, I've never been, but <laughs> is it? 
That's what it's like. It's is funny. It? I actually just coming here, guys, where I am. So this is the family that I interviewed earlier today. Uh, Bridget, I don't know. Can you see them there in the distance? Just There's a the family of seventeen, and they're just walk. Yeah, they're just walking in like a proper little troop. They're singing. They're chanting, providing some of the Irish vibes. So are they you coming over too? I think around here. Are they coming over too? It's okay. like twenty eight days later, there, isn't it? They're kind of coming in a big pack. <laughs> It's uh, and a, a nice three hours before kickoff as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, there still is quite a lot of time to go before kickoff, so I think people are probably just enjoying things a bit more. Uh, there is actually quite a lot to do around here. There's lots of food venues. There is very awkwardly a concert happening just behind me, and there's one guy rapping and playing. So <laughs> two people sitting on a bench, and he's like giving it socks on the stage, and there's just two people watching. Uh, and then we have like a bar area. There's lots of opportunities to kind of like play games, you know, with footballs. And then, of course, they have the, like the FIFA store is absolutely jammers. So we talked a little bit about it on the World Cup show last night, the fact how hard it is at home to get memorabilia. Not an issue in Sydney. Everywhere you go is front and centre. Matilda's merchandise. Various other countries as well that are in Ireland's group and are playing in Sydney. And uh, plenty of FIFA stands around the place. So it's great to see. Okay, uh, you've been covering this team for many years at this point. It's all coming up to uh, two, th- three hours and 20 minutes before the national anthem rings out. Like, it's very difficult for us to fully encapsulate the distance the team has travelled. How are you feeling? Uh, emotional. Like, I woke up this morning and it was strange. It didn't feel real. I was sitting with Emma Duffy downstairs and, you know, we're probably in the written press pack and then the broadcast digital side. Like, we've kind of been one of the few women along with, say, Ashling, who've been following this team. Oh, can you hear the national anthem? It's going again <laughs> in the background. Uh, we're one of the few women who've been covering this team constantly. And for us in particular, it's just, it's so massive today. You know, we were just sitting there having our breakfast, looking at each other, being like, we're actually here, we're in Australia. Today is such a momentous day for the team, but it's also a momentous day for everyone who's followed them, everyone who's loved them, everyone who's supported them. You know, this is a day that I'm going to look back for the rest of my career and be like, I was there. Even talking about it now, I feel like I'm getting choked up a little bit, but like, I'm here in Sydney about to watch this team become the first ever Irish women's team to compete in in an international tournament. And like, it's just... I don't actually think words can describe what I feel right now in terms of the pride of Ireland, the pride of this team, and just the fact that they've fought so hard to get here. It's never been an easy road, and there are so many legends that have to we have to pay tribute to in that journey too. There's, you know, Emma Byrne, who's on the Quick Game podcast. There's your Karen Duggins. There's Olivia O'Toole. You know, this is for every player who's ever put on the green jersey. For And this is for every person in Ireland who knows what it means to be Irish who loves sport even if you don't love sport it doesn't matter it's a great day <laughs> I actually think it's not just going to be a day you remember for the rest of your career it's a day you're going to remember for the rest of your life and and like football is the game of the people on a global level and it's not the Euros we've qualified for it's an actual World Cup we're one of the top 32 teams in the world it's an incredible acceleration of the process and you really really hope that the opportunity here isn't missed and we're starting to see corporate Ireland wake up to the value of supporting the team I really hope the government actually row in and give more than a half a million that they've promised to the women's grassroots game in particular and there seems to be a movement towards back in football properly because it really is the sport of the people and uh, you know this is the start of something hopefully Definitely. And I think when you talk to any of the fans out here or the people who have traveled an insane amount to be here, you talk to them and they're like, where else would you want to be right now? I mean, like the vibes are incredible. You get to say you were a little part of history. You get to say that you watched Katie McCabe lead an Irish team out in front of 70, 80,000 people. Like that doesn't happen. That, that has never happened for this team. And like, it's one of the biggest moments in Irish history is just a few hours away. And as you say, I really hope the team can grab it. I hope they can enjoy it. I think it'll probably be a while before they'll actually let it sink in. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a sensational place to be right now. And I feel very fortunate to be witnessing it. Well, look, we'll let you go off and mingle. Thanks a million for helping to set the scene. Uh, three hours out from kickoff. Can't no worries. Right. Chat to you later. Go on. See ya. Uh, we are going to talk to Luke Conley, Megan's brother, also a Cork footballer. 
Uh, Linda Gorman's going to join us in studio. She was one of the pioneers, played in the first international 50 years ago. An incredible woman. Um, we'll talk to her as well to soak up the atmosphere a bit. Shane has been down in Kilkenny talking to the great and the good of Kilkenny hurling. Um, there's some brilliant stuff that he's already got. Uh, and we'll bring you some of that. Seamus Hickey's going to preview the Ireland final for us from a Limerick perspective. Uh, Phil's going to join us to give us his considered views on what's going to happen today. That's just after nine o'clock. We'll play out with Fan Larkin and Joe Hennessy. Joe Hennessy is my favourite hurler when I was a kid. Mm. So I'm very excited about that piece. Very good. Did you ever interview him? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, maybe once. Um, this is like the leaving search today it feels without the exams do you know there's kind of well, there's a big it exam feels, coming it feels different do you know well I didn't have to study but um, a bit like your leaving search what uh, but uh, it's amazing so come here I, I found this jersey in the wardrobe last night oh look at look, look know, at the humble brag what, the what last, is the jersey how is that a humble brag so the 21, 21 years ago this is the last World Cup so poignant if anything the state of jerseys back then like this fits me now that was 21 years ago. I mean, why did they make the big jerseys like extra, oh, extra, extra oh, large? Okay, there was big, but they kids. didn't. It's, I was it's, 13. It's skin tight. You, it's you it's skin tight now, like, basically. But at the time, it was it was a like dressing gown. Um, I'm glad that they have five jerseys. I'm not mad about the shiny material. Do you know when I look at this? I think Apre match the three boys. Yeah. And then I think of the disaster Aircom shares of 2000. <laughs> Okay. Did you have some? I'm not personally not. No. Did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> that's uh, that's what I think of it. And as uh, Roy or Emma Carroll said before, and the jersey that Roy Keane never got to wear. Did you have a name and number on the back? No, not this. No, I never did for an Ireland jersey. I only ever had the um, I had Packy Bonner's jersey from Italia ninety, and this. I mean, two Ireland jerseys. Was that yellow? Oh, and, do, the, and the Father Dougal Maguire's. That one. Oh, is that not that one? No, that was from the mid nineties when we weren't qualifying. It was after 94, I think it was, yeah, you're on 96, World Cup 98 time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was happy, I, I saw it in the water, was, geez, this already fits, does it? There you go. Yeah, Colm, he, he was refusing to accept the humble brag, but it's totally like, look, this is a flex, look, I can still no, it's when I was 13, it's the same, it's the same size, I'm amazing, well done. I'd be happy to humble brag, but I'm talking about the size of the jerseys they made for kids back then. Well preserved. Uh, we should talk about some, I'll show you the back page headlines to try and give you a sense of what's, uh, what the media are saying this morning. High of the Tigers, Vera convinced the opener can be because her Tigers are going to take it to, uh, this is the back page of the Sun, are going to take it to the Aussies. Uh, the back page of the Herald is power ready to step into the unknown and it's a picture essentially of Denise O'Sullivan using the uh, the bands to prepare and show that she's fit and ready to go it's going to be a big night for Denise O'Sullivan uh, just go for it power just her Ireland players to embrace the occasion and show no fear stepping onto world's big stage is the back page of the uh, Irish Independent but they're also the front page and that's Denise Sullivan doing her stretching date with destiny Ireland look to live the impossible dream in World Cup opener it's been a bit slow getting here but I think the build up has finally taken off yeah um, yeah Manawesome mm. is the back page of the Daily Star this morning Australia versus Ireland 11am on telly uh, the front of the examiner sports section this morning has uh, them at the stadium last night looking around soaking it all in Katie McCabe singular looking off into the distance visualising sticking in the top corner hopefully first waltz showtime as Ireland looked to tame the Matildas in historic World Cup opener do I have any more Irish papers I do I have the uh, Irish Times and it's the picture of Denise in action uh, Ireland out to make golden memories in historic showdown so yeah you'd, you'd be concerned Australia they do be good at the old football I know well never more exciting than we are now like do you know it's like before you start a job you're never more in demand <laughs> before day one. Oh, is there a, oh go on and this is the most exciting part but it could, like look the optimist in all of us says that it could get even more exciting that this is simply Christmas Eve like and Christmas Day is going to happen later on in a few hours' time. When you eat too much and feel a bit sick and you, you have yeah, to have was, a little snooze. Yeah, and, and the they turkey... Put, trans- they put you to bed and they the, turkey up. <laughs> the turkey and ham translates to a one-all draw or possibly a 2-1 win. Well, Who yeah. knows? Um, no, it felt like... It, it, it does feel like, or it did feel like, the longest build-up to anything. I don't think... Look, it, it wasn't helped by the allegations and then the Columbia match and then Vera Powell having to answer those 
questions all the time both those questions and then Katie McCabe before they flew out saying thanks for asking about the World Cup so I think and also another point is that Vera Powell said the day that she named the squad was the worst day in her career you know things like that that it was a kind of very emotive and very kind of wow this is taking a toll on everyone yeah. but now that I think it's completely different this week and especially today and particularly what Kathleen just said there outside the stadium it was like that was all nonsense and it's all worth it for today before we get there because it's 50 years in the making literally this year we're going to hear more about that from Linda Gorman uh, later on about just how far this team has come and, and particularly how far it's come since 2017 it's, it's a day you could easily pass by you know that you could just take it for granted it's Ireland playing on the world stage great but it's like it is truly momentous and today feels like genuine positivity around the place uh, um, that book that I was reading The Football Man uh, really makes the point that football in England particularly in the 50s and 60s was the sport of the people and it was like this really embedded part of the culture that was you know the whole it's uh, not a matter of life and death it's more important than that like that was like I'm not doing justice to this but that it was a thing of the people for the people and football at its purest even though the Premier League has completely corrupted that notion uh, is still the single most simple popular game in the world and everybody plays it every country plays it and here we are on the world stage in the top 32 ready to go mm. and maybe we're deluding ourselves but believing that we've got a chance of doing something magical in the group totally we probably felt the same before Spain Italy and Croatia Euro 2012 though, it is a big group at the Eti. yeah 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 and like we got outclassed then because their football culture in those countries was um uh, tended carefully and minded and 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 uh, like there's a power in what these women have done to get the support that they've got to get to this point but it's not finished and that's why this is so hopeful that actually the legacy isn't qualifying for the World Cup the legacy is is insisting on more funding and insisting on uh, coaches and schools and insisting on being able to fill Tala and then move to the Aviva for that friendly and go yeah. back to Tala and turn it into a fortress like you know it's just it just feels like we're we're on the verge of a breakout yeah. if people get behind the team and that's everybody has to get behind the team like that's the fans that's the media that's like the administrators that's those people who know their way around a grant application like they're going to be some of the most important people in Irish sport over the next while other sports are really good at that football has not traditionally been good at that because it hasn't always appealed to those people but they're like you know there's a lot that they could do for you can you can really work hard for your country if you fill out a grant application for your local girls team to get toilets like that's a I, maybe people don't feel like that's enough to volunteer but that's really really important like if you can fill out forms you could be some of the most important people in the FAI over the next 12 to 14 to 24 months yeah that's the administrative aspect that we're not going to see that most people won't see but that needs to be done because if it isn't it won't happen but the other side the front facing aspect the easiest part of all of this is to simply keep talking about it because people will forget otherwise so if you keep talking about it normalising the fact that this is now a thing and it's not a novelty then it becomes part of the social norm and also you mentioned those friendlies at the Aviva like that should be a celebration and a homecoming of of what's going to be achieved down under and like that again is the optimist because you don't know what's going to happen there and the Euro 2012 comparison that first game against Croatia we thought we had a chance because that was the easiest of the three this time Nigeria is on paper the easiest of the three and it's last so we're going in here full of trepidation full of nerves but an underdog tag that suits Ireland just like it did a Euro 88 and Italia 90 yeah Exactly, that that was the we'll do them for you today, lads. Yeah. Uh, Joey McCarthy says, "Come on, Ireland." Uh, Adam Hetherington, good morning to you, Adam. Uh, morning, all. I had a nightmare, so I've been up since five a.m. No more meanies, crisp sandwiches before bed. Uh, uh, maybe try it again and see if the sometimes sometimes the dream is actually amazing. Uh, it's it's a fifty fifty whether or not it'll be a nightmare or so. I would say to keep going. Have a bit of blue cheese before bed. Live a little. Come on, Ireland, smash them up, says Hanoi Tripper. Uh, best of luck to all involved today. Looking forward to the game, says Michael. Bookies have us a 10 to 1 for the win. I didn't check the prices. 10 to 1's a big price. Yeah. Uh, so just like in the good old days under Jack, defend well, Nick won from a set piece. Exactly. Uh, 5 4 1, low block. And Caruso, Nick won on the break from Denise Sullivan through. Well, we take that. We take that. Yeah. Put your hand off of that. Uh, 
Adrian Kelly says Kathleen's great great to see young journalists being empowered to report on major events meanies Adam I thought they'd long gone says Ty Carroll no they still exist you still get meanies there's, uh, there's multiple variations of meanies oh we were minding our own business in the office uh, a few weeks ago and Tato meanies came in yeah in the actual crisp form but pickled onion flavour so you know uh, JP taste. Wright good morning to JP huge achievement qualifying for World Cup regardless of how we do today great show when it's not all about Monaghan lads I know there's been too much Monaghan in this bloody show far too much bloody Monaghan I really thought we'd get away with it uh, without mentioning it without mentioning Monaghan especially because the boy himself isn't here like uh, then again you yeah go on good to see such national pride and people celebrating the achievement of reaching the World Cup finals says Michael uh, Kathleen's got me more excited for this World Cup than all the promos from RTE and big sponsor she's brilliant Koi Gig says Richard Melia we would 100% agree with that and nil nil after 20 minutes hopefully the players settle into the game and confidence grows and then it gets quiet and then all of a sudden out of nowhere there's just a rumbling noise of Koi Gig I mean like building a fan culture around tournaments is the other thing that happens from qualifying for tournaments and so that means more people go to the games and that oh. means the, apparently there's been a shortage of, of shirts I've been away for the last couple of weeks so I was unaware of this but it's hard to get the shirts Yeah, you, you're finding it difficult to buy the new Ireland women's kit very disappointing that is the case yeah there's been loads of examples of Neil O'Reardon was talking about it the first World Cup show we had on the PM show last night with um, Kathleen and Sinead O'Carroll Sinead was saying she's very disappointed about corporate Ireland it's actually a clip that's gone pretty viral for us uh, for that exact reason um, merchandise wise it's very difficult to buy anything to do with this Ireland team but that's uh, and also the lack of bunting around the place it depends where you go like because if you're around Rings End you'll see a lot of it yeah but Abbey Darkin but in other parts you won't very much depends where you go yeah I, I've, I've seen a good bit of bunting uh, Ballybock is festooned uh, on the bus on the way in I, like again there is always a bit of bandwagon about all this stuff right and like what comes first the chicken or the egg the team has to perform and the team has performed to get to this point but any kind of a performance tonight anything scratchy anything that's like uh, interrupting the pattern of Australian dominance that we can get behind yeah like Dan Delaney puts it uh, well in this comments uh, here today all we want is that big moment the Wes goal like in Sweden type moment we want them one all we want the 2-1 but we want that reading in the airs where were you Ronnie Whelan Shindit top corner Denise O'Sullivan from distance Kitty McKay marauding up the left wing from deep hitting a speculative effort top corner that's what you want that's what this is all about that's what we're here for yeah it's the whole point yeah also Shawnee Riley great getting up early for these games a real feel of uh, Japan Korea all over again very true I mean, it's not that early it's 11 o'clock not early really. for some people if you're on the late it's in, really not that early in two and a half minutes time the tournament starts or it's due to for the first game and then here we are like what's that three hours away uh, it's going to be night in Australia Ty Carl. every paddy I know is going to John Fitzpatrick who was like oh tonight and somebody was like the game is on at 11 this morning fair enough and then the most important uh, contribution so far this morning from James Sweeney yeah how is Colm only 34 I'm 30 I look 10 years younger you can fuck off James like oh! if you if you right, send, oh whoa it's 7.57 in the morning and you're send, the producer <laughs> send the uh, send the picture in yeah, pick. I, lo- I love proof I mean what you said is so subjective and pick. also untrue Picks or it didn't happen, I believe. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Kids exactly, say. James. Sitting, uh, there, sitting there on his couch, laptop down here. Okay, all right. Away, you know? no, stop yeah, now. Yeah. This is, a, this is yeah. a kid-friendly show. Come on now. Oh, my God. <sighs> we'll fix it in post. 7.58, we're going back to Australia. Luke Connolly, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good, James. How are you? Yeah, we're very excited. You must be beside yourself. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, been like a kid now at the moment, so it's been... It's been a long while since I put a jersey on over a jumper, but uh, but yeah, we're in that, we're in that state today, so it's uh, yeah, it's a great atmosphere. When do you last have contact before a match kicks off with your sister? When does she like send the message to the team to you? To you guys going, yeah, I'm in the team. It's all when good. She was she, yeah, she she was sending tickets this morning, so it's a bit of an exception. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been pretty much radio silence though for the past. 48 hours so I think she's uh, I think they've kind of just locked themselves in now and they're focusing completely on the game so um, we've stayed away as well we haven't made too much of an effort you know just let them drink it in yeah that's the the good old fashioned uh, GEA treatment of I'll sort the tickets out but don't talk to me yeah exactly exactly yeah 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 so it's well drilled in our family anyway that you, you do it early and then you ignore every call after that so um, yeah it was done done nice and early when did you guys get over to Australia we got here yesterday morning, so after about 24 hours of travel, we landed yesterday, um, and we've just about acclimatised the jet lag and everything, so um, yeah, yeah, looking forward to the next three weeks. 
Oh, it's going to be amazing. Like, so it has been, we were talking about how long the build up has actually been. It, it has been a very, very long time. And here we are two hours before kickoff now. Uh, how are the Connollys feeling? Uh, there was a lot of pacing, a lot of pacing around the hotel. Uh, as I said, the canvas of us is definitely Megan today. I think the, um, she's she's definitely, yeah, she's definitely camera in the four of us. I know you can tell you that much. So um, a very jittery, a very jittery morning. I won't tell you. Was that the case uh, when Megan was watching the Scotland game with Sheila Hamden that she was the calmest when the full time was still in? Yeah, hundred percent. No, as I said, no. I, as we, I'd always be more nervous watching Megan play anyway. But yeah. Uh, yeah, she she shows a lot more composure than the rest of us. So um, yeah, we kind of need to just split up and go our separate ways and calm our own selves down and then uh, get back in. <laughs> just for anyone who hasn't heard, Luke, can you bring us through what your dad did at Corinthians in Cork, the club, just to get the girls team up and running and the significance of that? Yeah, so look, I suppose he, he's got great press over the past few days, um, so he's, he's delighted with that. <laughs> um, but no, it generally, like, look, Megan obviously started playing with Corinthians with, with the boys. Um, and full credit to, to the lads and, and the coaches at the time though they were, they were great to Megan um, she played there was never an issue you know and, and she held her own as well which helped um, but obviously it got to an age around under 11 under 12 where you know it, she needed to move on to a girls team um, ideally it would have been with Corinthians now at the time there wasn't any uh, ladies facilities um, and so the old man look took it on upon himself um, went canvassing printed flyers went to all the schools um, I managed to drum up with the support obviously then he got a street leagues that kind of stuff going and from there just built it out kind of got a, a group of 20, 25 girls and kind of kept that together up until I'd say 17, 18 um, even after uh, Megan left you know, he still kept it going for a lot of those girls and, and I think a lot of them were very appreciative of that um, but look the, the end game was to get Megan where she is today and you know I, look, there's a lot of fathers do a lot for their daughters um, but I can't imagine a lot of them get the outcome that we've had with, with Megan being here today. Like so, um, as I said, when it happened back in in October when they qualified, I think a lot of the joy was directed more at, at Dad than Megan, you know, because this is a, a really a, a full circle moment for for him. And there was um, so yeah. And there was a harmless bit of child labour going on as well at the time, was there, with the flyers being made at home? <laughs> yeah, I like I like the way they included that. So um, yeah, look, we all we all chipped in. I like to think that I was a, a coach, but. You know, the longer away from it, I realised I was just basically there to pick up the coins. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. My coaching didn't start there as I thought it did. <laughs> uh, you do have a, like a really deep understanding of what the team has had to go through to get to this point. Megan obviously went to the States for a while, is, is now playing in England. But, like, you, you fully understand that, like, there wasn't that opportunity that the next generation are going to have because Megan and people like your dad were trailblazers. 100% look I suppose we, we've we've been there and we've been there to a lot more difficult you know, qualifying campaigns obviously the one that sticks out is, is the European campaign where they, they crashed out against Ukraine you know, with a, a free going goal with Anya you know that if you tried 100 times again you wouldn't do but um, yeah look this this is not again it's hard to print the words it's hard to kind of I suppose quantify what this achievement means to, to these girls you know and, and what they've done for I suppose Irish or soccer, but I suppose for women's sport in Ireland itself, you know, you, you look at the rugby sevens, you look at kind of what's all coming behind it, um, you know, the, obviously the J ladies, what they've managed to achieve in the past few weeks with, with their stand. So, um, look, this is a bit of a cherry on the cake for what's been coming in the past couple of years. Um, so, yeah, look, a huge credit has to go to some of those girls, particularly, you know, the Louise Quinns, the Nia Fahis, the Anias, who've been there a long time you know and have put in a lot of effort so again I spoke with Full Circle moment for there's a, a cohort in that team that um, this is as full circle as it gets and the other thing is like they're literally from all over the country from the, the four corners uh, yeah in, in fairness look I, I, we've been trying to I suppose hang on to any Twitter content or Instagram content the past few weeks to try and get an insight of the camp but John you know, what you can really see is that they're, they're an exceptionally together group um, do you know they're, they're, I don't think anybody sticks out in that group there's no nobody who isn't you know, gets on well with everyone so, and I think that's clear and evident that do you know there are 23 30 players do you know the girls who didn't make it um, even how they handled obviously the squad being being caught that time do you know it, it, it takes a strong group to get over something like that and, and have those girls to support them behind the background What will uh, Megan's preparation be like now knowing her like this is an unprecedented crowd that she'll be playing in front of but will that change the way that she approaches the game? 
I, I, look, I, I don't think so. Obviously, she, playing in the double cell, she's, look, she's been able to play against big teams, you know, and, and they've, they've, again, it's hard to quantify what this will mean. You know, we were at Tala for the France game. They they called out that there was 7,500 and we said, geez, this is great. And then we kind of said, again, kind of a pinch me, what, what's 80,000 going to look like? You know, it's, it's hard to even imagine what that type of a crowd in the stadium will look like. So, um, I don't know. I, look, I think it can only be excitement. You know, there's only one feeling you could probably have walking out in front of a crowd like that. And I can, I can uh, confirm that there is a lot of green. So um, it it will look fairly fairly home based. I would hope. What uh, what jersey do you have on there now? I've the I've the white one. I've the white one. So uh, um, yeah, we thought we'd be a bit you know under pressure. So I, I went with a nice calm white color. <laughs> um, I didn't get the Conley six engraved jersey that the rest of the family have, so I probably I probably look a little bit left out. Oh, why not? Uh, I I don't know. I just uh, go with the white one. I like the white jersey, like <laughs> so. <laughs> I said enough. The parents have their moment with the with Conley on the back, so you can get it doesn't a- need four of us to find out. It don't need four of us to find out who we're here to support. So ah. two is enough. <laughs> <laughs> you can get it. You can get it for the next one. Listen, we let you go and enjoy the yeah. the um the rest of the pre-match stuff what's your nervousness no, like? that. Uh, I'm actually I'm not too bad now but it, I, yeah look as I said I don't enjoy Megan's games I never have um, I go to all of them but um, I get zero enjoyment of them and that's that's too nervous but that's look that's a good thing um, you know I think the Slovakia game the, the, that qualifier is probably one of the most unenjoyable games I've ever watched um, which showed to be one of their best results so um, no, I'm not too bad now, but I'd say when we get into the, the fan zone now, it'll start kicking in. And final score prediction? Ooh, uh, I, uh, my strong thoughts is that if we're in the game at halftime, if we get in at nil all, that we will nick a result here. So um, I think any time they've played strong opposition like Australia, if, once they've stayed in the game till halftime, they have a good chance. And obviously with Megan on set pieces, look, I think a set piece goal is definitely going to happen tonight. <laughs> Fingers crossed it's for us. Luke, good stuff. Thanks a million. Enjoy. Cheers. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Uh, Luke Conley, Megan's brother, also a handy footballer in his own right for Cork. was in, um, I think, the time capsule 2020 was my entry when Cork beat Kerry. Porky Cueve. Oh, yeah. The COVID year. Yeah, yeah. One of the two COVID years. You remember his high ball to um, Mark Keane, wasn't it? Yeah. Who was home from Australia beautiful I thought it was a great pass I don't know if it was a Hail Mary attempt at uh, a point but I think they needed a goal at the time they so did, they what did. A you'd have to assume that he knew the story or and it wasn't going to just take but the points but it could have been a Shane McGuigan um, oh, that's what you know, to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fine player lovely player I was actually on to our own Tommy Rooney yesterday being like how would you analyse Luke Hanley the footballer and the adjectives in return like it's what you'd want to be described as right mercurial skillful, innovative street footballer alright great he wears it well yeah uh, yeah I can only imagine how exciting it must be to have your sister playing today and like uh, but specifically the journey that our family have yeah. been on because he's the older brother and all the stories were that uh, Megan would follow him around and idolise him and wanted to play with him and so you know he definitely would have helped by playing football with his sister to get her to the standard where she was holding her own with the boys and then they set up the girls team and then as he says his dad is paying it forward and uh, training other kids as well so that's the bit that is the force multiplier in all this yeah where you suddenly have multiple coaches and getting the the mums involved and inspiring them to become coaches is the next big step as well Um, uh, you know it's still predominantly male coaches and that's something that we need to work on yeah um, but there's loads, there's loads of uh, loads of room for growth. But like that story is, it's just so captivating because it was entrepreneurial that family what they did because no one was doing it for them. And then like name checking the the coaches in that Examiner article, like I remember those coaches and they were all always so supportive. But like when I was playing, it was a few years before Megan got started, and like every Saturday morning there would be seemingly hundreds of boys on the green pitch like in the training pitch not a sign of a girl at all and the girl might be driven home after the son you know is dropped to training so that's how quickly it changed and Mick Conley was a huge part of that so like perfect to have Luke on the show there the day of because 
they, they did so much but look their story is just one of the 23 like you know yeah and they're getting there early they're uh, <laughs> definitely getting oh. to the stadium early which uh, you know you should do look there is something that we haven't spoken about on the show yet this morning as um, Colin has just said the game uh, in New Zealand has kicked off there was a little bit of doubt about that because overnight there was a shooting in Auckland two people were killed and the gunman uh, six six other people were injured and the gunman uh, was also killed so uh, three dead in total uh, the initial fears obviously were that this was you know potentially a terrorist attack but it turns out that uh, they identified the shooter very quickly he had a um, a monitoring bracelet on him because he was on release for uh, domestic violence charges but was going to a construction site where he was working and the incident happened at the construction site and the police in Auckland are describing it as a standalone incident uh, so um, there was a history of domestic violence they're the early reports I hasten to add there the early reports coming out of Auckland and so there was some initial concern that perhaps this might have been a terrorist attack and so therefore there might have been an impact or knock on impact on the game but the game has kicked off this morning after a minute's silence for the victims of that shooting and obviously we'll bring any more details on that that are relevant for you uh, this morning it's 10 minutes past 8 yeah um, two anniversaries there just to touch on before uh, we move on uh, Roy Keane signed for Manchester United 30 years ago today? this week yesterday and Ronaldinho signed for Barcelona 20 years ago yesterday huge day for football big day yeah and um it's easy like obviously we talk about Roy Keane ad nauseum on the show which is fair enough but Ronaldinho how he changed football as well it's good like it's, I can't believe that's 20 years ago the story of course was he was supposed to sign for Manchester United um, allegedly demanded a helicopter to bring him over to sign and they were lying around having that and who did they sign instead? Cristiano Ronaldo they went also the, 20 years ago yeah they went for the future right yeah 2003 could have signed both of course I know 12 and a half million though was a lot of money at the time but yeah. um, 20 years ago it's hard to believe for two or three years that guy was a joke like Ronaldinho football was a joke to him yeah yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. do you know what I mean yeah uh, and 30 years ago from right and there you go so that's yeah. the accent it's also going to be in 20 years time people are going to be going oh this is the week that uh, Jordan Henderson signed for Al Etifak we're going to have to learn the names of yeah. these teams I might not, I'm, 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 I'm undecided about whether or not I'm going to pay any attention to this at all like I can't see myself watching any of it oh I do like watching Riyad Mahrez he's like one yeah. of the players I really enjoyed like Mahrez Mahrez gone. also gone quality yeah, so player Riyad Mahrez must be thinking I'm actually better than Jordan Henderson why am I getting half the money he's getting is he? he's getting 370 grand as all right. 700 grand so 700 grand have you done the maths on 700 grand? <laughs> not yet 120 million in three years Tax free, netto, as yeah, Ruth Hullett would have said. <laughs> you, you understand the appeal. Do you think in like the next five years' time that um, your kids or kids around the country will be asking for Saudi clubs jerseys because they're going to continue to attract some serious talent? Mares, I think, is a step above. Like you know, you could argue Mares is in and around his peak, falling slightly out of favour in the Man City t- side, not really getting into the team later in the last season. So understandably, he wants to move to play because he's quality. But to go to that league, like he could play at a very good club in any of the top five European leagues, and he's chosen to go there. Um, all of the outcry from the anti-Chelsea brigade who were like, "Oh, Chelsea are just using this as a way of washing their books." They've all shut up now. They're like, oh, we don't really need to investigate this anymore because all the clubs are benefiting from offloading their uh, highest earners. And Jordan Henderson was two years into a four-year deal that didn't look great three quarters of the way last season. People were like, oh, he's not going to be in the team anymore. Doesn't deserve to be in the team. Then he had a slight, slight uptick in form as the team had a slight uptick in form over the final five or six games. Maybe, sorry, over the final two months of the season they're like okay he, he can play again he's back to something happened he's back to where he should be and um, and now I don't know what, what do the Liverpool fans think of this because like Jordan Henderson has had one of the all time great Liverpool careers like uh, restored the team to title winning wins the Champions League it's as good a, it's as good a career as, as any of those yeah. like and, and when you come back after a famine and you win something there's even you're even more cleaved to the bosom of a fan base but it doesn't matter 
it, it, what happens next doesn't matter to the Liverpool fans or does it matter does this somehow damage his legacy with the Liverpool fans because if you're not a Liverpool fan like you're you're going to say oh he's just taking the money and um, yeah I think uh, Henderson took people aback that move because you know he was uh, a big advocate of LGBT rights and then he's going over to Saudi Arabia and we all know the problems there with that so I think people were a bit like I guess the word you'd use to describe is disappointed that he went but then you, like you just mentioned the eye-watering figures and everyone has their price now you could are you I'm sure he will say playing under and being reunited with Steven Gerrard his idol the player that he was supposed to replace at Liverpool and eventually did was an attraction but other than that it's very hard to justify it beyond the financial package and I think people expect it from certain type of players, let's say, to go over there, but not Henderson. And I think that's a turning point for people. And people will look at him a bit differently. If you're asking me if I think his legacy will be affected, like, slightly, yeah. I'm, like, generally, I don't really care too much about what uh, Carr says about stuff, but he was very, very strong in June. Uh, it was June. About potential for Bernardo Silva moving there and how, you know, they need to investigate this. He's in his peak years. How they've taken over golf, big boxing fights. Now they want to take over football. This sports washing needs to be stopped at Premier League, at UEFA. Um, does it still need to be stopped now that Fabinho, getting 40 million for Fabinho, getting 12 million for Jordan Henderson? That's good money. That's it, half your Alexis McAllister money back. But like in terms of wages, uh, it's it's good good money so what does everybody think about this if you are a Liverpool fan or if indeed if you're a fan of one of those other teams do you remember uh, it took off in China a few years ago they signed didn't uh, some clubs signed Oscar do you remember Oscar the Brazilian yeah, playmaking yeah. for Chelsea and he was thought, absolutely his peak uh, and yeah. Hulk as well I think went the Brazilian striker and people thought oh geez, like this is the end of football but it, was, it seemed to be a bit of a fad I think with the uh, number of players that the Saudi league is signing in such a short space of time since Cristiano Ronaldo went there last winter is a bit frightening for the rest but maybe it will be a case in 10 to 15 years time that Saudi football will be the equivalent of the Premier League now and that's where everyone's going to be watching their football and they leave the morality aside that's kind of the danger in this uh, absolutely very potentially that is the the outcome and the difference between the Chinese money and this money is that um, that wasn't state sponsored as much there was uh, certainly some club ownership some uh, state ownership involvement in China but you can tell that like the PIF have a lot of money we know they have a lot of money we know they're printing money on a daily basis they're pulling it out of the ground faster than they can actually count it so uh, that money isn't isn't about to dry up in our lifetimes uh, particularly as we continue to be completely reliant on oil I know maybe it won't be at some point maybe it is finite well I mean it, at some point <laughs> maybe it truly is yeah but not yeah. in our lifetime no that's it <laughs> your kids kids uh, yeah, well, will there still be a planet for our kids kids who knows uh, right the myself and the two kids with jerseys on here very excited says Nigel Gallagher all we want is that big moment as you said the Wezo goal uh, great getting up early for games already done that one um, hey yeah sorry uh, James Sweeney and somebody else was like I was just as arrogant at 34 says Brendan Gannon I don't know if he's talking about you or he's talking about uh, your opponent no my opponent's 30 so it must have been me but I was just defending myself that's all uh, just home from work in the quagmire that is uh, Roselle Interchange at Inner West Sydney at 10 to 1 I'm throwing on a ton says Coleman O'Brien bear responsibly Coleman and heading to the game enjoy that that's going to be fairly sensational and then we're just getting loads of koi gig coming through uh, I think I feel a bit of food poisoning coming on here at work so I'll kick in fully around 11 a.m. 11 a.m. a morning in the jacks for me says 91 Devo <laughs> no no just insist this is a national moment and you're putting the telly on and that's it it's like we're, we're going to have the telly on we're all going to watch this it is yeah as a nation that's kind of the excitement of it being on in the morning of a work day isn't it it's kind of a bit homework off feel to it like uh, John Smith says Kathleen walked by us and did an interview us devastated mostly because we're wearing rugby jerseys <laughs> come on John get your stuff together uh, Knock Nahidi in full voice this morning says Brendan Gannon um, yeah is it yeah it will be the Connolly's from Rock Mahaney? No, Denise O'Sullivan's right. crew. Yeah. Uh, come on, Ireland. Can't wait for kickoffs to Sarah Corbett. I'll be kicking them on, uh, cheering them on from Madrid. I love seeing Kathleen's report. It got the emotion running. Amor Akhalini. Yeah. So here we go. 19 minutes past eight this morning. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to get in touch, 087 9180 180 is the WhatsApp number. 
A reminder, Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of Off The Ball. Uh, Braeburn Coffee is coming to an Apple Green store near you. New Braeburn locations are popping up every month. Make sure you visit applegreenstores.com forward slash Braeburn to find your nearest Braeburn Coffee experience. Here's Kathleen talking to Connemara fans by the stadium. So Siobhan, we are here. We're in Sydney. You are an Australian resident, but you actually come from Galway and you have 17 members of your family. Not all here yet, quite, but there's quite a few. We have the Gowla gang Woo! from Connemara. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Margaret, hi mom and dad. <laughs> um, tell me, what's it been like having everyone coming over for the World Cup? Uh, just an amazing um, opportunity, really. My family were going to come over and then Ireland qualified and then the, the timing was just perfect. They were actually supposed to be here this time last year. The pandemic, the pandemic kind of threw that out. Then the World Cup was this year. They qualified. They were coming anyway. So it just icing on the cake. And to get tickets um, in February when they moved it to the big stadium was just, yeah, yeah. absolutely unbelievable. So I had a few of them on, online at the same time in the middle of the night. Trying, we were all trying to get tickets together. And, um, yeah, we managed to get tickets. So we're all heading out there this afternoon. Yeah. And excitement levels are pretty much through the roof, I think. <laughs> I was going to say, the big day is finally here. It feels like we've been talking about it for so long. How have you found the atmosphere around Sydney since you've been here? Um, a little bit subdued, I think. We've seen a lot of Irish people. We saw them at the airport on uh, Tuesday morning. A few Aussie supporters. But I think the Irish seem to have been the ones are standing out the most and clearly we're, we're the first match up so um, yeah. I think yeah, the Irish are definitely the ones that are standing out the most and making the most noise so yeah it's fantastic and as someone who's been based in Australia what's your prediction for this evening <laughs> I do think that the Irish will give a great performance, but I think it might be a 2-0 win to Australia. Yeah. I, I have a feeling Sam Kerr might stick one yeah. in. Oh, maybe Kate. I don't know. There might be a, a couple of goals, I'd yeah. say, yeah. And uh, do you think we could get a Come On You Girls in Green from your crew before we go? I reckon. Will we, can we get a Come On You Girls in Green from the family? Yeah, yeah. They win. They win. Ready, steady. Come on, Come on You Girls in Green! OTB AM The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports Tune in and support us please <laughs> We need every little bit of support um, We might be outnumbered here in Australia But we can definitely feel the love from back home We've wanted to be here and we've wanted to be here for so long So at the same time we want to show what we're capable of And, and play to our strengths too And um, see how it goes Subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now we're going to Australia. <laughs> surely. Surely. No, there's no surely. Screw you, accountants. You can't stop us now. Off the ball. Cheering on the girls in green. OTB AM. The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. Uh, so the accounts obviously did manage to stop Nathan. He's not in Australia, but uh, he'll be he'll be doing the last word today, I think. Yeah, he's yeah. been doing it this week. Yeah. yeah, so make sure you tune into it. Uh, it's 22 minutes past eight this morning. We have living legend Linda Gorman with us in studio. Linda, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very excited. Can't wait. What are your nerve levels like? Uh, my nerve levels are quite controllable. Right. You know, it can get into the zone, you know. Yeah. But the, um, the idea is to manage your anxiety and, and your stress levels coming up to it because you don't want to expand excess energy and then have nothing for the pitch. That's the thing. And it's such a new, overwhelming experience. My point to this is, though, that Australia must be feeling the same thing as well. Well, obviously. Or the more. Whole, yeah, well, I, I suppose the pressure is on them, you know, to perform really really well today again it's a showcase for them in front of the home crowd and um, wouldn't surprise me if half of them were of Irish ancestry as well and um, so does you know it's a lot of pride in them but then certainly a lot of pride in us yeah like it's such a momentous day but can you just maybe give a synopsis to everybody of how far this team has come in the last 50 years since that first international against Wales that you were involved in yourself? Well, the, the striking difference is that when there's proper coaching structures in, proper management and proper um, uh, resources that you can do amazing things yeah. and this team has shown that particularly in the last five or six years when when the FAI got behind them when the country got behind them um, and they've just and of course the media coverage has says it all because we didn't have that so when we went and played in Wales in the first game uh, sure nobody knew 
mm. that we played in Wales we just came home and that was part of it when we played in Dublin the following month nobody knew when we played in Wales uh, in October of the same year 73 now that was completely different because by that time we had had a proper coach in Kevin Healy uh, we had been training extra for the Dublin girls so to go out and play against a formidable French team who had beaten us in Parc de Prince um, 1973 to go then in 1978 having uh, had all this coaching really proper structured coaching we knew what our job was um, to go out and draw with them in Tolka Park was phenomenal in terms of they were hopping mad right. you know absolutely hopping mad I've, I have um, momentum from them in terms of uh, their best player I think her name was Michelle Wolf. she was a massive player but I happened to be marking her and um, quite a few really crunching tackles right. but one she got me on the hip and a sliver I was going to ask were you giving it to her or was she giving oh, it to no. you oh no well listen let's put it this way uh, she wasn't getting any joy with me so she went across to the other side and of course <laughs> Bernadette Cassidy was equally as aggressive so she really didn't get a look in but she certainly left a mark on me right. because I she chipped sort of a sliver of my oh, no. hip bone and yeah but I mean that's these things happen you know you have to be brave and fearless and passionate and give it your all and that's what our girls are going to do today there is there is uh, the Australians have been talking about us being a physical side and our physicality being something that they're prepared for and sure I like I mean I'm sure they're going to be equally physical but you need to make sure it doesn't boil over because referees in the opening game of a World Cup can frequently be like oh I'm going to lay down a marker here and I'm going to going to make a name for myself and try and get a game later on in the tournament as well so how do you how do you manage that? Well I suppose the referee will set the tone of the game you know uh, but you have to try you have to go in with your crunching tackles and your will to win the ball say it's uh, an 80-20 ball you have to go in with everything so again you have to test the referee as well to see what they're going to allow I mean we are a physical team but there are you know the African teams are quite physical as well um, the um, French are quite physical you, yeah. you mightn't think it but they're very good at using their body yeah yeah. Well, they were very good against us in, in Tala a couple of weeks ago as well um, uh, there was um, a couple of things that went wrong for us but Vera had assured us that they were going to be rectified yeah and I think uh, Katie McCabe came off with like a precautionary injury after half an hour as well and I, there is a significant difference I think especially in the pre-World Cup friendlies where the team we know the team basically it's, it's been fixed the team that was named for that team is going to be the team we think that we'll be getting news of in the next hour or so and um, I can only imagine how if you're named in that team you're like oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play in the World Cup I'm definitely not going to try and get injured tonight as well so there's just a bit whereas I'd say France had a proper competition for places in, in some sections as well I would agree with you there but if you went out and I've never done it myself ever ever in any game go out with the thought that maybe you will get injured you know it, you can't have that thought in your head at all you know and, and Katie was absolutely right to come off a friendly like France is not um it's not it doesn't make any difference no. to us so it's better to be cautious and to have our strength in coming to the World Cup as opposed to finishing out a game we beat Australia in a friendly in 2021 and at that stage there was there had been a really bad run of results now against some of the, the better teams there have been a bad run of results and there was some murmurings about Vera uh, but that result turned it round and then we went on a run of winning games and confidence surged and all of a sudden here we are making history today qualifying for a World Cup and playing in the World Cup it has been a real roller coaster well <clears throat> my interpretation of that game they had come to Ireland on the back of having played the Olympics and um, and then what happened was they probably had jet lag. I never saw so many passes that went wrong. And I, I mean, uh, Care was hardly in the game. She hardly got anything. Their touches weren't great. So you don't know what else was going on with them. You know, it happens to us. It happens to all teams. And I was delighted to hear that Vera was having games over there because you need to shake the cobwebs off. Right. You need to be able to play in a, some type of realistic 
game, you know, um, to get all the cells in your body yeah. ready because it's quite a, a journey to travel over there. And then the exhaustion of fans that they're great with the fans and then the media. So you have to get into a zone. And tickets. You're sorting out tickets for friends and family as well. Like it's, a, it, it's all a new experience. It is, absolutely. Now, they would be used to it to an extent, particularly recently in the run up to the World Cup because the public publicity they're getting and the demands on them you know you manage that type of stuff not in our day like they have sports psychologists you know you have your routines we didn't have anything because we were going to work and we were saying you know uh, next day is work and let's go you know and train for the the next match but you also trained with your club so it's completely different to our day i'm not sure about the um like sports psychologists work but you also have to have something in you as well well they're working with the raw materials you have that's it it's like uh they can help you shape the thing that the inner drive and uh, like so we were talking about this yesterday katie mccabe uh, was working in Nando's wasn't particularly fulfilled by it and then got the opportunity to go full time professional but like she was ready for it you know and and even then there was a she had to overcome at one stage it looked like they were going to send her out in loan but she got named the Ireland captain and uh, like that inner drive that she has even though she'd never captained other teams has led her to the point where she's ready for this today Absolutely. She's a fantastic leader. And I mean, it shows in the way she performs. And that's my measure of how somebody is. And you saw against the French game, she was badly missed when she came off. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not necessarily that they depend on her, you know, in terms of um, uh, it's, it's her, their dependency is on our leadership. And, and and not what I say, it's what I do. Yeah. That type of leadership. It's the moral courage thing that John Giles always talked about. It's like she'll show for a ball and uh, she'll be in the 80-20, but she'll be the 20 and still come out with it. And all of a sudden that just gives the team a lift. Yeah, but you need that. You see, you need people who are willing to put themselves on the line, you know, come what may. But don't think that it's not a calculated thought like when she's making a move for a ball to win a ball it's all very much calculated can I win it but your determination gives you that extra half yard Are you um, a fan of Vera Pau's set up for the starting 11? Um, I'm not quite sure what the full starting 11 is I sort of hope that Katie McCabe is not going to be in the defence because she's such an asset in midfield um, my uh, Denise O'Sullivan is, for me, is the real playmaker because of the position that she holds. In terms of, she when she passes a ball, it's the type of ball that she passes. It's always like there's a second ball going to come from that. So it's much the same as snooker. When you're playing the, the white ball, you want it to land and set you up for the next. So I, she looks as if she's that type of player. Um, I hope that we're not going to be stretched. I hope that we're going to stay tight and compact um, and read the game a little bit better than we read the French game because we stood off them too much. And I was one worried like if people didn't know their responsibilities because in the system we played, if, if I was a left full, anything that came into the this area was my territory and if I lost the ball I had to win it yeah. you know so it was sort of a different mentality and they play a different type of style yeah I hope that's a psychological thing where they were just a little bit off that because there was so much going on whereas today it's like absolutely the day of your life well staying away from media and all that and getting into the zone and being a group and knowing the, the, the final starting line is only just going to enhance it and then when you think you have players on the on the bench mm. who you know like um, they would come on and give us a bit of strength and because they're just ready yeah. you know some players are better coming on than yeah. starting Amber Barrett's record off the bench is sensational yeah, well, six or seven goals are off the bench yeah, yeah because if you think of it like she comes on as if she's played a half a game she's straight into it yeah. and yeah. what I love about her is she's goal orientated yeah. that's what she sees and I see that with Anya O'Gorman as well like her first thought is forward pass can I find somebody forward if I can't find them I'll go to the side if I can't find that I'll go back you know but it's always this planning and thinking 
it's nil all by the way in the open game so far after half an hour it's New Zealand nil Norway nil I think Norway are favourites for this game um, but after half an hour if we were nil all after half an hour we'd be like okay that's it half an hour of the World Cup in everybody take a big deep breath let's go I, I'm, I come from the um, mindset of uh, best form of defence is attack right and you need the whole team to do that. So when I talk about that, I'm talking about if you put pressure on the person on the ball, the other players around you have to be able to read the game so they're cutting out any potential pass. You know, and sometimes if we stand off too much, they're gonna they're, they're so technically good, mm. they're going to um just you know, walk around us. Having said that, when you look at the experience on those of those Australian players, I mean, they were all on the underage international teams, and they their debuts were a very very young age. Yeah, yeah, and so they have they have tour- some of them have tournament experience of oh, the underage tournaments. Um. Yeah, yeah, but the, the the age where they made that debut, I mean, fifteen for care, you know, eighteen is the average. You know, and then when you look at the team and you see like the countries they play for now in the regular seasons, um, I mean, up to the first five ranked countries, are, you know, the, yeah. the Auss- Aussies are playing there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So they're, they're a very good side. We, oh, we need technically to be, very good. Technically very good. We need so to be with cautious. Your, with your philosophy of attack as the best form of defence, regardless of the personnel that get picked here, are you in favour of the back three that Vera Pau seems to play for Ireland? And, and and to actually mention one person, Katie McCabe, quite deep as a left wing back, is that getting the best out of her and also the team? Well, I saw them playing. I saw Katie playing left full in one of the American games, and she was making great passes. But the pa- she ha- and she was making excellent passes. But the passes couldn't be supported because they were long passes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Now, if she was to play in midfield and look for openings that the two forwards can get in behind them, yeah. that would be wonderful, you know. Um, Vera obviously feels that the Australian attackers are very, very strong, you know, and, um, I mean, they're prolific goal scorers. They, they have huge amount of talent, and that's one of their assets, that they are goal scorers, and they wait for the opportunity. Um, and again, with... Katie's experience that might lend a hand but Louise Quinn is quite experienced as well yeah no totally yeah. Uh, the age profile is kind of exactly what you want it has some uh, old stagers who know exactly mm-hmm. what it means to be in these games and then it has a sprinkling of youth and some inexperience in terms of um, the setup but new blood that has come in and kind of freshen things up as well so well that, that's very important anyway for the development of the game at that level and you have to remember we're going into the Euros in September yeah. so that's a great you know and Abby Larkin is just shining now for such a young player yeah. you know she's she came, did really really well against France um, so she's potentially you know, a, a wild card from the bench as well yes uh, um, Linda before we wrap this up we, we've been talking obviously about the game specifically but in terms of a legacy for the tournament right um, I think it's it's fair to say that the FAI didn't capitalise on Ireland qualifying for Euro 88 and Italian 90 we kind of like just let, let that happen and we didn't build academies and we didn't build facilities and we didn't make the case that football should be getting funding at a, a level commensurate with the popularity of it and also the potential for jobs like it, you can literally create hundreds if not thousands of jobs in the football industry if we had one um, what do you hope comes out of this team qualifying for the World Cup <coughs> my biggest biggest hope is that we will now be able to measure ourselves technically against the best teams and my belief is that we have to match them technically facilities You know, they're wonderful to have, but it's the ability to be able to have an arsenal of skills at a high level that you can execute in speed to match the other teams. And also that you have enough leg, you know, enough enough in your legs for a quite an amount of speed on the pitch. Now, I'm talking about all out speed because, you know, in games, everything is 100 percent. You give everything 100 percent in your in your in your runs. So that needs to be matched off. So maybe we need to escalate. The, the, the amount of speed work that we do so that's uh, strength and conditioning and coaching is, is kind of what you were talking about as absolutely a legacy. Yeah. and I'm talking about futsal 
that type of stuff cover. I'm talking about that. That that's so so important at a young age, you know, and that's where we need to be looking at the young age. You made your debut for Ireland 50 years ago, obviously in the first ever fixture. You're still playing football now. I am. I love it. I had the game with the guys yesterday up in Abbottstown. Um, they're one of the groups I play with. I also play with the Bows. I'm heading off there now to watch the game with some of the ex players. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I absolutely love it. And if I could say anything to any of the girls to encourage them to come back, it's the question that I get asked all the time by the girls is, are you not afraid to break a bone? And I say, when, when I went out to play football, I never thought I was going to be afraid or never entered my head if I was going in for a tackle that I knew I'd no right to get, but I got. You play, it's walking football, is it? Ah, listen, don't use the word walking. Do you want to see my bruises? <laughs> and that's only my hand. <laughs> well, I want to use in the description you used when you were inducted into the FAI Hall of Fame last November and you were talking about how you played two or three times a week, is it? Four times. Four times a week. Yeah, I played down in Cherry Street, Olivia Tools. That's really skillful. Olivia Tools. Now, I wouldn't have the futsal and all that, but I have, a, a, I think, of say that I have a good reading of the game and my first touch is good and my first pa passes are good but only because as a young girl there's a tree outside my house that was planted and in the morning before I went to school I got the ball on my own on the green and just tried to hit the tree you know that type of stuff I think there's an argument that Cherry Street might be the most important road in Irish football why do you say that? because like about 15 Ireland internationals have come from it that's what you know of. You should see the skill down there. And, and the only way I could explain it to you, I, the, the 70s and 80s World Cups, Brazil and Argentina, and you'd see someone, uh, or Cruyff, a skill that, God, that's amazing. And I can guarantee you, 24 hours later, that would be mastered in Sheriff Street mastered to a T. And the measure of it would be that it would be used in the game. So and so, it, I went out to see Sheriff playing another Sheriff team. Um, the, the players have moved to different teams, and a skill at the over thirty fives was right, amazing. Right, <gasps> fabulous. Well, Linda, enjoy the game today. Who are you watching with? I'm watching with Breda Hanlon. She scored first goal um, at home against Northern Ireland. I'm playing with Bernadette. I'm meeting Bernadette, Bernadette Cassidy, who. Um, was named man of the match against France in 78. Um, Catherine Bourne, who played international both at underage and also um, senior, who went off and um, had a career in America, um, and a few other friends. Listen, Hall of Famer Linda Gorman, always great to spend some time in your company. Thanks a million. Enjoy Thank the game. Thank you very much. It's uh, 8.41, as I said, scoreless still, 38 minutes gone in the game between New Zealand and Norway. Up next, Shane Hannan live from Kilkenny. First, here's Kathleen chatting with Emma Burns' mates. We are here on the steps of Sydney Opera House with some Irish fans. Guys, you just came in this morning, last, last night? night. Yeah, yeah, last night. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, where did you come from? Uh, I'm Monaghan, a dub. Uh, dub. Shocking, shocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Up the dubs. Kildare. <laughs> and I'm Leitrim. <laughs> and what has you travelling to the other side of the world? I mean, there's not all that much happening Pretty at the moment, part, is yeah. there? History, yeah. really. Like, you know, it's the first time any Irish team really is in a major World Cup, but part of women's history really yeah I've grown up playing in football with a few of the girls Amber Barrett who played Ulster schools with her so mm. coming over to sport the girls that you've grown up with all along it's come here you have to be part of the moment don't you it's amazing yeah. even wouldn't, the vibe in the place wouldn't amazing. have been the same from home you know <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just eating okay though I just Manana hair and I was in sport, I was just yeah, talking to you. Nice more jash and I don't know on a hair and couldn't sport image, so yeah, so much yeah. unsauce of it and so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Louise Quinn, who's got school in school, I teach him lesson and so oh, yeah. yeah. And what was the atmosphere like then in Blessington before oh you left? God. So excited. All the kids were just buzzing in the school. Yeah. Really excited to see Louise playing, you know. And just like the girls said, witnessing history, seeing Ireland Absolutely. here for the first time. Yeah. Brilliant. And how have you found the atmosphere around Sydney since you've been in? Oh. Uh, quiet last night, but this morning now, we're walking really around in the yeah. Ireland jerseys, yeah. everyone's yeah. stopping if us along the way. If anyone has a touch of green at all in them, I think yeah. you're yeah. part of Ireland yeah. today. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, um, there's really good vibe around it. Anyone who is, like, look at Ireland or Sydney here is half Irish anyway. Yeah. 
yeah. to be honest yeah. and anyone we met a man from Athlone there he didn't even look like he was from Athlone no, so. no. <laughs> it was it's great all the teams from Athlone yeah. so it doesn't matter what county you're from once you're Irish you know you're, you're welcome here with a flag yeah, yeah. yeah no it looks it's great it looks it, like it's amazing to even be standing like with that oh, behind surreal. us you know it's, it's, it's amazing yeah, yeah. yeah. This, uh, never never travelled down this far before so yeah. it's, it's, it's cool to be here in Parrot history like and what's the result going to be tonight oh Ireland's going to win no they're not uh, I no, I'm digging uh, out for a one all, all, one all draw would be nice yeah. now I think if we can aim for that Lauren there on that one one yeah. all be amazing yeah. Air of you. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Yeah, they're having the crack. Uh, it's going to be uh, either the crack for Limerick or the crack for Kilkenny on Sunday as well. Seamus Hickey is with us. Seamus, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Ger. I'm good. I'm nervous, nervously anticipating the weekend, but I'm good. Um, what has you nervous as a matter of interest, specifically about Kilkenny? If I was to sum it up very simply, right? So 12 months ago, same teams met. I think Kilkenny have gotten better. I think they're a better squad. Um, I think they're a more rounded team and, and I'm not sure Limerick are better uh, I, I, I'm not sure especially with the losses of, of, of Sean Finn Declan is you know Declan Hannon centre back is you know given every chance to play but you know in terms of fitness in terms of level of performance this year uh, I'm just not as confident uh, but uh, you know I, I definitely think Kenny are a better team Was the game a bit weird last year in that Limerick kind of let Kilkenny get back into it and that maybe they won't do that this year? No, I think last year was a bit strange because I do think Limerick were were the better team. It's just that Kilkenny had a knack of hanging around the game where I would say they were, you know, they, they really couldn't get ahead of Limerick at any stage. Um, they were Limerick was, were just not able to separate themselves. I don't see this final going the same way. I, I really do... You know, I, I would probably see Kilkenny as more of the aggressors this time. Um, like considering what Galway did in the first half against Limerick, just to kind of destabilise them, uh, kind of really attack their puck out. Uh, you know, really get to grips with the middle third. Like Kilkenny are really well equipped to do that. Uh, you know, and I think especially with on Cody playing the way he is, Adrian Mullen really operating well now around the middle after his injury troubles early in the year. Uh, on Cody's boots have been moving faster than ever. Uh, I'm a big fan of those. So, but like, it's just, it, I do think they're they're a better team. And TJ is giving them what TJ does. Um, really, really good leadership, good decision making, uh, ability to win dirty ball. He's not he's not burning pace. He's not getting into space as much as he used to. But um, absolutely, as as dangerous under a high ball and his ability to distribute. So. You know, for me, they're a really daunting proposition for for this team. And uh, look, it's, uh, obviously, there's been league games in between, but last year's All Ireland final does seem particularly relevant. In in the first half, in particular, one of the things that kept Kilkenny oh. in it was TJ's freeze. And um, maybe don't foul as much this year. I realise it's very easy for me to say that, and I'm not involved, but it might be a good idea to just talk about that and try and plan for it. Yeah, but so like. Limerick's discipline has ebbed and flowed. Um, like the first half against Galway, uh, Evan Nyland scored seven points from freeze. Um, and it really was key to Galway pushing Limerick to the brink, um, say, you know, with a six point lead and a goal chance uh, after 20, 25 minutes. So, you know, if, if, Limerick, if Limerick's tackling is frenetic, if it's not composed, well, then Limerick are actually a, a free machine. Uh, they, they, give away, they give away a lot. Um, and now with the police completely the John Keenan now is 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 uh, ref in the game his first All Ireland final he typically lets play flow typically um, calls you know are typically well earned I would say with John Keenan so maybe maybe that's a good thing for Limerick uh, but it really is you have to get your discipline right um, especially against Kilkenny because you know I would say even more, this year their I think their scores from play have been far better they've been far more efficient. Uh, from play up around 65% of their, their shots are actually going over the bars compared to Limerick is about half you know it's about 50-55% so Kilkenny's efficiency from play is better but TJ is still automatic so if you're giving away a freeze uh, from your own 45 up the field then, then you're probably giving your giving them an opportunity so it is it is worth talking about and you can talk about those things but ultimately composure is entirely about how you handle uh the circumstances and how they change in a very pressurized environment uh, and there's nothing more pressurized than, than the game coming sunday and and like it shouldn't matter but it clearly does that there's history on the line with a four in a row 
like how do they deal with that how do they I mean obviously we know Caroline Curd they talk about her all the time so she'll be earning her corn this week but what can they actually do so, so it, to me it's funny the history side of things from a, just from a pure Limerick's perspective it hasn't really been spoken about it, from a Limerick in a Limerick context in a Limerick public it's not really a topic conversation most of the topic conversation this year was are we going to make it out of Munster um, are we you know the, the Galway semi-final considering how tight it was last year uh, we got a bit of confidence from the Munster final against Clare and actually pulling out a result but it, it really is getting like you you know you know, survive and progress is really the has been the Limerick theme for the last two years. Even last year in the three in a row, some of that three in a row talk was was damped down by the fact of these games are super close, and you know we're really just trying to survive in a lot of these games. Um, you know, I think this year they have gotten into more of a, a rhythm than I say at times last year. It really, really was a struggle. Um, really was from the Munster Championship, Munster Final, uh, and then the other final, semi-final against Galway last year was, but it was a struggle. And then top it off then, I nearly got sick in uh, the Hogan stand last year. It was so nervous and so tight. Um, I'm not great to watch games at the best of times. But, uh, well, I was going to say, do you, are the players feeling the same? I mean, you you, you know them very well. Are they? uh, so they're, not feeling, they're not feeling that. They're, but they're basically like, uh, it's particularly... You know, when it's when it's on the field, it's far easier to play these games uh, than it is watching. So, watching and supporting, you've got you've got the ability to, and particularly from a sports psychology side of things, as a player, it's next ball. It's it's uh, you know putting the last either positive or negative thing behind you, uh, and you you're, you're affecting the game in the next ball that comes your way. So, you know, there's a far more element of control for a player. Um, and, and even with the ebbs and flows of games, momentum and different things, uh, you still have that element of, 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 of affecting the outcome. So, um, you know, I can only <laughs> I can only shout so loud. But so it's the for me this time when how do you manage it? Caroline Curd is constantly preaching same. It's constantly and and you see this in, in sports uh, in sports media especially. Like you've got players are just. It's it's a monotony. It, they get into a groove of next game, you know, concentrate on the one, one minute at a time, and don't get ahead of ourselves. Respect the opposition. You know that you actually become hypnotized uh, to that, and and you end up saying things that you know you, you don't necessarily believe, but you're like these. It's banal. It's going to get me through this, and for my mental focus, I'm just going to say these things that don't affect me either way. So like I'm not going to. Thing there, I'm not going to put them down to give them an, an edge. I'm going to talk them up. I'm going to, you know, you end up saying a lot of stuff you don't believe. Like uh, you, you just get into that uh, autom- automatic, automated uh, space. So, and from a sports psychology, it is. It's it's routine. It's rhythm. It's it's keeping things the same. And your approach the same. Your preparation the same. Um, and does four in a row have an extra stake for this Limerick team? I don't think so because I genuinely don't think. And knowing the players, they're not obsessed with history. Okay. They're obsessed with winning. Well, let me let me, let me do something slightly different. Then uh, th- it's so difficult to do four in a row because by the end of that third slash fourth year, everybody has seen every second of you, and and the piranhas are biting as you go along the carcass of of your dreams. And yeah. so maybe that's the four in a row might not be a psychological thing. It might just be that it's so hard to do because you have to be perfect four years in a row to get there. A hundred percent. And what I absolutely love, and what I really really thought that you know John Kiley and, and, and Paul Knurk now he was forced by circumstance uh, but the Willow O'Donoghue who moved to centre back last like uh, the semi-final against Galway it was it was a complete change because Limerick have been prepared for by opposition pretty much the exact same way since 2018 because it has been much it's pretty much been the same 15 more or less uh, give or take you know Mike Casey got hurt uh, Barry Nash came in Richie English was in there and you know Changes maybe around the full back line. Sometimes change in the full forward line, depending on whether it's Peter Casey or you know whether it's Graham Mulcahy. So there's been small change, but largely the blueprint is the same. And teams prepared for Limerick to pretty much the same way. And it looked like last year and this year that teams were finding a way to to to, to, to tame them uh, and to kind of bring the fight down to close quarters. Whereas in 2021, really it was uh, Limerick blew out everybody. Uh, by, by large large margin so um, you know this year and forced by circumstance of a key player at centre back and I didn't like it you know I was nervous enough about Declan you know, but trying something different even something as, as simple as key into Keen Lynch to midfield uh, and 
Will O'Donoghue back to centre back. How how effective Will was at centre back, we could talk about. It. I think he grew into the game in the semi final, but the first half it really didn't look comfortable. But that in itself has changed the way the opposition now has to prepare. They don't know whether Declan's going to start. They don't know whether Keane Lynch is going to be eleven or nine. They don't know whether, whether Will O'Donoghue, who is you know imperious around the middle, whether he's going to be hoovering up breaking ball and you know, give additional collisions around the middle or whether he's actually going to be holding at six and whether you can actually drag him around. So you actually do have to prepare for them differently now uh, because of the personnel. Uh, and to me, that's that, that, that has positives insofar as it keeps the opposition guessing. But, you know, for the negative is obviously that you know, I, I've, I would argue that Limerick are, are, are far more stable and and, and better organised uh, with De- Declan at six. So... It, but but it, that unknown, that that guessing, like for us in 2007, we played Kilkenny. It was uh, it was the expectation of the six forwards of Henry Shefflin at 11, and then Henry Shefflin then ends up at 14 at the edge of the square. Eddie Brennan goes into the corner instead of the wing, and in the first 10 minutes, they had two goals because of let's say the the disturbance uh, and the I suppose the unpreparedness for the change uh, and and if you don't plan for all the eventualities you can get caught by one yeah uh, it did feel a little bit like um, it sounded like they were backing Willow Dunhu learning experience to be better that was certainly um, the interpretation during the week from what John Kiley was saying to Ashling uh, when we Sarah Dunham on she was like oh that might have been the, the cat creeping gently out of the bag with uh, he'll be a better player for that experience it's like okay 100%. yeah so um, I don't think we'd be surprised if Declan didn't make it this weekend at this point but it obviously would be a blow yeah I worry wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't make it uh, because you know it, the, the knee injury sustained is, is, is it's one of those things where if you have if you have a, a four month season uh, and you've got six weeks uh, to recover then get game time to prepare yourself for the latter stages, you've got chance. But uh, really, when the the All Ireland final is your <laughs> is your testing ground, I don't know how I don't know how you 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 go into that, uh, particularly with a, a position as, as important as centre back. Guessing um, now, if they pick him, it means they're sure. Uh, but also, if they pick him, he might not start. So <laughs> there's, there's there's that's the gamesmanship and Limerick haven't really been traditionally known for that in the last four or five years and maybe that's an ace in the sleeve yeah one, one last thing um, is Derek Ling's Kilkenny also a different challenge from Cody's and that it's the start of it or something and so you come automatically with just fresh ideas and innovations and some of them will work and some of them won't but whatever about it it's certainly a different challenge as a result of it just being a new voice and a, a new plan of action I personally don't think it's that different um, I don't think that the Derek Link Kenny is much different to, 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 the, to Brian Cody. Now, what I will say is that the dynamic, and it looks like the the, the bond and, the, and the, the team dynamic seems to be better. So, you know, you can argue that that's different. But fundamentally, in terms of tactically how they play the game, I haven't seen anything dramatically different. Uh, you know, even they might set up for they set up for puck outs slightly different in terms of their their, their defensive setup for for opposition puck outs, but it's not dramatic. Um, I I don't see Kilkenny as being that different a hurling proposition. What's different is confidence, um, unity, and 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 how they play the game. I think it is it just flows better this year uh, than it did last year, and uh, and part of that is just because of the really good balance that he's got between the incredibly experienced bench that he has. The younger players that he's given opportunities to, uh, and then the leaders that are emerging from, you know, the, the likes of the Cody's and the Mullins, uh, to to take the burden off TJ. So it's really, really good balancing uh, that that Derek has done, and and it does seem like light touch leadership that is, you know, that that is good for the whole. Yeah, this rivalry is now a classic. Like this is this this has become obviously Limerick and Clare over the last couple of years has been a classic, but it, it's the hallmark of a great team. That you can have more than one rival, and uh, if they win, they cement themselves. I know the history isn't a big thing, but it is like this will be. In, they're they're on the brink of being an all. They're already a really great team, but this is all time greatness that awaits them. Yeah, like the whole run started in 2018 in the quarter final by beating Kilkenny by a point in third. Like, so ask anybody about 2018 when when it was that we we actually believed we could do something, and it was that game. Uh, it was it was beating Kilkenny after all the close calls, the near misses, the heartbreaks in you know 14 and 12. Uh, you know, go back to 2007 what happened. You know, so it, it really was a case of you know the, 
it, the breakthrough happened in, in Thurles that day when Tom Morrissey scored an incredible score um, you know from the sideline under the, the new stand so like Yes, I, I, I do think that Kilkenny will always be in the crosshairs because uh, like the 1973 team, Limerick team, is celebrating 50 years this year. They beat Kilkenny in that final and were beaten by the Kilkenny the following year. So like that, that for Limerick is always there, uh, that they have always been the obstacle when we're trying to do something um, and when we're trying to establish ourselves. You know, And it has been the case, particularly when we thought we were going places in, in, in 14. Yeah. Uh, it was So for me... It is, a, it is a rivalry uh, and for Limerick it means something. Seamus, I hope the nausea isn't too overwhelming. Enjoy as much of the game as you can. Thanks a million. Thanks, guys. It's uh, Seamus Hickey giving us his thoughts there. Shane Hannan, you're in Kilkenny. Good morning, Ger. How are things? Very are good. Keeping? Very good. How are you? I'm, I'm flying it. I'm, it's, it's actually strange. I'm standing in the familiar surroundings to yourself, uh, Canal Square. Usually this is the scene of the, the post-Imro hangover, looking for a coffee maybe. Um, so it looks familiar but it's the first time I've been um, perhaps sober. feeling normal at this time of the morning right. here, yeah. and sober good. yeah, yeah. Uh, so. it's also sunny what's going on? oh it's gorgeous literally we've got the River Nore behind me to my right hand side the River Court Hotel Matt the Miller's across the river uh, the famous statue of the, the hurlers you've seen this one before dedicated to all who hurled for Kilkenny it turns out they like hurling in, uh, in Kilkenny Jared. I don't know if you knew that but uh, it's gorgeous, yeah, absolutely beautiful morning in Kilkenny. It is a central part of the identity that they hoover up all Ireland's, but they're in the midst of a, a little mini Kilkenny famine. It's funny because I, I chat. I, I was speaking to to Fan Lark and Joe Hennessy yesterday down at the uh, the James Stevens Club, the Village, uh, famous club, of course. And like that famine seems to be on the lips of everyone in Kilkenny at the moment. Like eight years, it's eight years, and, and I guess that that's not really a famine to most counties, but to Kilkenny, that's. That's an unbelievable drought. And, and it's clearly, I, I guess the 06 09 thing has come up a lot as well. The four in a row, like if Kilkenny could become that team to, to kind of stop them, that seems to be the thing. And also the fact that, and Joe Hennessy mentioned this yesterday to me, the role of honour. Kilkenny are now kind of well ahead of everyone behind them in the chasing pack. So this is a chance to stretch that lead, I guess. So all of these things matter to Kilkenny people, Jer. Turns out they're, they're born winners. It's funny how the role of honour is something that is like a real motivation. Whereas like, you know, <laughs> you and me are like, well, you know, to win just once, lads. I hear you even wrote a song about that. Literally, uh, give me just one, please. But no, it, it, like the, the atmosphere, considering Kilkenny wins so often, I would say because of that drought, there is more of a buzz and more of a hype this week. Like you've got all the flags up. I was driving through, uh, I was in Martin Fogarty's house yesterday and driving through Castle Comer and uh, out the old ba- Ballyragged Road. And like there are plenty of flags up. And I've heard people talking about the likes of Kilkenny and Kerry in, pre- in previous years where maybe there wasn't much of a build up, wasn't much hype. I agree. Um, but I think I think it's got it's got to that point. It, it, and also, there was a lot of giving out, and, and everyone I spoke to yesterday, uh, included, said like the two week the two week build up to a final is just a pity, isn't it? It's like, too short. It is too short, especially you, this year when it clashes with the Open, which we haven't mentioned today, with mm. Ireland in World Cup action and everything else that's going on as well. Yeah, and, and and also the fact that I guess in July usually you'd have the the schools, the trophy going around the schools maybe next week in, in either Limerick or Kilkenny, and you just don't have that when the schools are out. But I guess look, you're, you're kind of, it's going to be going around the clubs, it'll be going around the towns and villages of Kilkenny. Um, but I had a real unbelievable experience yesterday just chatting to some of the people. I got a got a nice beef burger uh, from uh, from him in Langton. Shout out to him in Langton. So I know Owen was looked after well by them last year as well. So um, like the scenes in there I'd imagine on, on previous iterations of All Ireland uh, weekends win or win or lose I guess but it's just such an iconic venue in John Street there and, and, and you just you can feel the hurling through the walls and, and Eamon Langton has been around for for generations and uh, he, he's just an amazing man and, and doesn't do many interviews I was happy to speak to him yesterday um, some of the interviews I think Gerard aren't, aren't, will be up on YouTube across today but like I'd encourage anyone if you're a hurling fan not just a Kilkenny fan. Listen to Fan Larkin and Joe Hennessy talk and talk about the state of the game currently. The uh, fan was was calling for more more hurlies to be broke over, fellas. Uh, <laughs> which which I mean <laughs> sums up Fan Larkin. I think he, he was only he's five foot four fan. Like I was towering over him and to th- to think of him as a feisty cornerback back in the you know sixties and seventies and those great Kilkenny teams. It's hard to imagine, but he just he he took on lads so much bigger than him and. Uh, uh, Joe, Joe Hennessy agreed with him and uh, to be fair Eddie Kerr was, was playing that down a little bit more but I, I think he expected it of, um, of Fan Larkin yeah. but to, to even like, it, 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 it's funny the way the old lads go on 
Well, Ed Carr was nearly killed at one stage by on the on the field. Um, so uh, we have some. We actually have some clips from these. So what's the order here? We're going to go. Is it uh, modern hurling? Not a real thing. <laughs> well, this is the thing. Like I was chatting to Martin Fogarty, and he was he was of course the the national hurling uh, coordinator uh, and development officer for the last uh, number of years. He finished up in that role last year. Father of Connor Fogarty as well, of course, who made that unbelievable block for Kenny against Clare uh, in that in that semi final a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so he's obviously nervous going to these matches, but uh, he has a lot of views. He's an unbelievable brain on hurling, so it was a pleasure to spend some time in his house yesterday, uh, uh, just outside Castle Comer. But yeah, he, I asked him about modern hurling and, and maybe his his gripes with that. So that's the first clip I think we have here. The term modern hurling wrecks my head, right? Because hurling is hurling, and um, you know the field is the same size. It's still fifty in a side. The only thing has changed is, is the light, the lighter ball, mm-hmm. which means that ball is travelling faster. Um, and I think it's going to come back around again. You know, the, the whole sweeper system for a start is, 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 is crazy. I haven't seen any teams win with it. <laughs> and as I have I've spoken to some friends of mine that, that use and say, look at the games that you're winning with the sweeper, you're going to win them anyway. But what people don't realise is when, when they deploy a sweeper, they're automatically creating one at the other side. Mm-hmm. So if you take all Ireland champions, Bally Hale, and a team says, if we're going to beat these guys, we have to pull a sweeper. And straight away they're leaving Owen Reid, or not Owen, they're leaving Richie Reid loose at the other end. <laughs> and, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. But, you know, other things then, like trying to short, short passing. Now, Kilkenny were short passing as long as I can remember, mm. back when I, was a, when I was a young fella. And they'll short pass if a long one is not on, or if they're under pressure. But to insist on short passing, that if I have a ball here and you're standing 20 yards away and I am instructed, no matter what, I have to play it to you. Well, that's nonsense. Yeah, uh, that full thing is actually available on podcast already. So who's next, Shane? Yeah, <laughs> I just love that. That's nonsense. Like that term modern hurling pisses Fogarty off so much. And, and then you kind of understand that these lads who uh, came up and he was even talking about the Clare, the Clare puck outs, the short puck outs the last day. And, you know, He's querying why teams do certain things and complicate the game, but uh, yeah, that full thing's up on on YouTube. I uh, was chatting to Kieran Cuddy yesterday as well, of course a news talk uh, man, but also a Kilkenny man, and Bobby Kerr, down to business presenter. So Bobby uh, Kilkenny runs through his blood as well, and uh, he was speaking to me yesterday about um, the great Eddie Kerr, who was a neighbour of his. But were there players back back in that era that, that just really, in the black and amber, brought it to life for you? Or, or how well, did your love well, of it start? Eddie, Eddie Kerr mm. had a score of 35 goals and 336 points, now outclassed by TJ Reid. Okay. But he was a neighbour of mine. He lived about 200 yards from my house. Right. He was a friend of my father's. He worked in the bank. And I knew we knew him just as Eddie, you know, and he was just, uh, and he was a fine hurler. Yeah. I remember vividly the picture of him going up to collect his medal. It would have been probably in the mid seventies, with blood streaming down his face, <laughs> and going up and holding the cup. And again, he was a fantastic hurler. You talked to Eddie Carey as well. Yeah, like Eddie was in superb form yesterday. Uh, looks unbelievable for a man in his early 80s as well, I have to say. He was playing golf the, the day before in a golf classic. Um, and like he was even talking about Muhammad Ali when he came to, to Dublin in 1972. Eddie Kerr's father was massively into boxing and used to get Eddie around the, the wireless and listen to some of the boxing fights across America. And when Ali came to Dublin in 72, Eddie Kerr gets this call to to essentially meet up with him and, and puck around with him and show him how to play the game of hurling, which Ali loved. And the two of them started pretend battering each other with a couple of hurls which I'm sure Fan Larkin would have approved of uh, but but Eddie was in great form yesterday like what a legend uh, there, and obviously but before my time but still what there a man. are amazing photographs of Ali and Eddie Kerr which we, whenever we, we put some of them up on social because they're, they're literally as I think there is a photograph of um, of him like threatening of Ali threatening him with a hurl but there's also just yeah. like there's just it, and obviously they're in the 1970s style which now looks unbelievably cool. When we were kids, like, oh, look at that. I can't believe that. He looks so old-fashioned. Now you're like, wow. Such classical lines and, uh, and genius. By the way, big, big, big breaking news from the World Cup. The Black Ferns are 1-0 up against Norway. This is totally unexpected. So hopefully it's not a harbinger of things to come. Maybe uh, Ireland can spoil the party. Maybe it is a harbinger of things to come. Not the home team, but the underdog. Yeah, there we go. That's a, I'll fix that one there in real time. <laughs> <laughs> the little hamster is like moving very slowly this morning yeah so 1-0 to uh, New Zealand the crowd has erupted and they've gone completely mad Eamon Langton 
Yeah, Eamon Langton, what a man. And uh, I hadn't realised, I, th- I thought Langton's was linked to Hurling essentially because of the, the parties afterwards. And I know there was that link with Brian Cody over the years. Uh, but Eamon's uncle, Jim, was an absolute legend, Jim Langton. And uh, when, I, when I mentioned his name to Eddie Kerr yesterday, Eddie said he was his hero growing up, Jim Langton. So uh, it runs in the blood, family-wise. That Eddie Kerr interview will be up later today on, on YouTube as well, so that, that's well worth a watch. Uh, but Eamon Langton, I sat down with him yesterday in, the, in Langton's hotel, uh, and he spoke about his uncle Jim. It's, it's not just family linked to the to the hotel, but but there's family linked to hurling yourself as well. I'm just looking at some of the stats here for your uncle Jim, yes. Jim Langton. So uh, two all two all Irelands, if I've got this right. Yes. He's got an all star as well, uh, a left wing forward by all accounts, and this is the incredible one: 15 goals and 146 points. And I think it was only uh, surpassed then by, by by the great Eddie Carey years later. So tell us what you knew about your uncle Jim growing up. Well, my uncle Jim was much. As my mother used to say, your Uncle Jim is what we need. He put our name forward. He was an extremely good hurler, won two all errands, 39 and 47. And as my mother said to me one day, don't ever fall out with your Uncle Jim. <laughs> he was that kind of character, wasn't he? Uh, he was probably the, certain, uh, the same type of character off the pitch as, as on. Like those two All-Irelands that you mentioned, both beaten Cork, I think, in the final. Like, would you have been... What are your memories of those and even being told no about them? <laughs> I would never assume so. <laughs> no, I'm afraid I didn't see either of those. I was fortunate enough to come about in 48. But I'm sure you were told the stories and I'm sure Jim oh, yes. passed them on. He had great friends. He had one particular friend in Kilkenny, the Kilkenny secretary, Paddy Grace, which was well associated with Kilkenny. And then he had great friends, the great Laurie Marr. And he had a good friend of his that went to New York, Terry Lahey. Star, every one of them. Right, OK. Jesus, that's a long lineage all the way back to Laurie Marr. Uh, we've got one last one from you, Shane, before we... Um, get back to the football yeah I think this is Martin Fogarty as well so obviously Martin was uh, as well as the national hurling coordinator for, for a number of years there he was selector under Cody for, for eight years and, and I think they won six All-Irelands in that time so an incredible Not record not bad uh, and the players that he would have played under so kind of spoke about the, the Cody exit last year and Derek Ling's takeover with uh, Martin Fogarty yesterday have a look like that, that, that era that you would have been a selector under under Brian um Oh five to thirteen, like a remarkably successful six All Irelands and and all the other titles that came with it. Uh, it must have been a, an absolute privilege to have been involved with such a a dominant team really across that that era. Yeah, well, uh, it, it was. It was. Uh, Michael Dempsey and myself. We came from under twenty one. We we were fortunate to win two twenty ones, and we possibly had the best team of all the following year, which we were heading for three in a row, but. Brian asked us in then, and um, oh, five, that wasn't a great year. <laughs> we were playing Galway in the semi-final, as far as I recall, and we were looking for a shovel there about halfway into the second half. I think we were down 10 or 12 or 14 points, so it wasn't too nice, but the lads, the lads dug in and, and they hauled it back to a goal, so that was, that was tremendous, even though we lost it. You could see the character in the team that day, oh, five, which... Um, I suppose that's that's what happened after that. Then that character came through and got to turn over Cork in all six, and that was the beginning of some very good days. It must be incredible to even to see someone like TJ Reid still involved, and not not just still involved, but but still involved playing to the level that he's playing at. Like he's he's just a machine, isn't he? Yeah, well, it's it's great from a couple of points. Um, to me, the great thing about it is, you know, age is a number, and over the years. I've seen, I suppose, players um, cast aside sometimes by the media <laughs> when when they shouldn't be cast aside. Yeah. I mean, I'll go back, uh, you weren't even born. Frank Cummins was a tremendous Kenny midfielder years ago and uh, even, even Eddie Kerr in his day and uh, the, the media decided that these guys are finished and suddenly mm-hmm. they're gone. So TJ has shown that age, you know, it's nothing to do with, with age really. You're either fit enough and strong enough or not. And even looking at the referee now for Sunday, um, I think he's, he's, he's 50 and this is his last game. Mm-hmm. But age shouldn't come into it. I mean, you're either, you, you could be burnt out at, as a referee, you could be burnt out at 40 and some lads that could be flying at 55. So anyway, that's, that's somebody yeah. else's problem. You got a bit of wisdom there, Shane, from the, the good and the great of Kilkenny Hurling. You're on your way to Limerick. 
Yeah, on the way to Limerick today. It's actually, it, it is a privilege and honour to be speaking to lads uh, like this on this week, all our final week. So I'm, I'm heading to Limerick today, going to chat to to Joe Quaid, Eamon Cregan, Richie Bennis, all separately. I mean, wow. those, those three lads have, have more All-Stars combined than yourself, Nathan, and Joe picked up Imrose in this city. So that'll tell you the, the amount of All-Stars they have. So uh, yeah, what an honour. And uh, like to be chatting to those lads today in Limerick is going to be pretty special as well, so can't wait. A PhD in hurling. We'll stick it all up on YouTube and we'll stick it all up on podcasts as well. And we'll play more for you tomorrow as well. Shane, enjoy. Where are you going to watch the game? Uh, I'm going to try and find a watch party in Limerick I think I'm going to drive to Limerick it's only about an hour and a half two hours so I'll, I'll pick up somewhere there and and, uh, and get a watch party if I can Yeah, and uh, or, no, or an early house maybe no points obviously Shane good stuff see you tomorrow thanks a million Cheers, yeah. Shane will be back in studio with us tomorrow hosting and uh, bringing some of the goodness for that and also some reaction to the Republic of Ireland nil Australia nil Phil isn't that what we're going to Phil Egan good morning to you a nil all draw that's what we're snap your hand off for right now yeah although I feel like a one all draw would feel like more of a, a world cup a world cup and especially if we were to equalise it would feel like a win yeah and it would uh, wake the entire country up to the fact that we're in a world cup yeah absolutely and look I've always felt that it, it's all on this game and I, that means obviously there's a huge amount of pressure but if we can get a draw then it pretty much guarantees we're going to that last game against Nigeria with something to play for. Okay, so um, it's 14 minutes past nine. It's New Zealand 1, Norway nil. You've been watching this game? Yeah, in, in between kind of jumping in and out of studios. But yeah, Norway just haven't looked that convincing at the back. And Wilkinson, who got the goal, had a few sniffs of a chance in the first half. Just that final ball let them down. But a fairly clinical finish and... Norway would have been favourites for this game. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, their attacking talent is unbelievable. They have Hegerberg, obviously a former Ballon d'Or winner, Wrighton from Chelsea. They have Manham from Arsenal. They have Caroline Graham Hansen, a Champions League winner at Barcelona. Like, even those four players, you put them into any team, like, they would get into any team. So the good teams are choking is what I'm hearing. Well... The pressure's getting to the good teams. I was, expectations. I was thinking that, but then I was like, oh no. The home team. The co-hosts are <laughs> raising their game, and that, that is the worry. I do have a feeling that Australia are going to be on it today. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a reminder for everybody, Off The Ball is coming to the Cork Podcast Festival. Join us on Sunday, the 27th of August, in the Cork Opera House. Jimmy Barry Murphy is going to be in the house, plus a few other famous faces to be announced. For tickets, go to corkpodcastfestival.ie forward slash off the ball. And a reminder, some highlights for you on the Off The Ball Podcast Network. Sean Og uh, was in studio with Joe Malloy last night. Great stuff over an hour long. Uh, football Daily, your daily football fix with Phil. And all the World Cup build-up and reaction is also in the football feed. Uh, we do also, I think, have Kathleen back with us. Kathleen, a few more people there now. Hello, guys. Yeah, a lot more people around now uh, yeah she caught me just as I was coming back after chatting to a few Irish fans and got to send back some great audio everyone is so excited such a good buzz ran into it's like Rovers captain Emma Hansbury who asked one of her friends if she wanted to come to Australia on Sunday and she booked flights over here which is absolutely mental Brianna Jarrett was also walking around the place having a great time and um, they have flamethrowers here there was an uh, Australia band who have co-opted Ole 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 and turned it into an Aussie tune. No. And uh, yeah, there's just lots of lots of stuff happening. I was doing a little video for our Instagram, which people should definitely go check out because I was just kind of showing everyone around the stadium when I was attacked by an Australian and <laughs> he jumped on my back and started singing up the Matildas. So uh, yeah, lots, there's a really good atmosphere around here. Really, really buzzy. Lots of stuff happening. Uh, and how are you feeling now? It's 1-0 to New Zealand against Norway, by the way. So uh, not a great day for the favourites so far. No, not a good day for the favourites. I literally saw that there just as I was about to come on to you guys. I mean, what, I only saw maybe like five minutes of the game earlier and it seemed like New Zealand were very much on the back foot. So great result for them if they can hold out. And I mean, good sign for us maybe too, as you say, if it's not a great day for the favourites. We don't mind that. We will take that. We are definitely looking for any signs that we can take. Uh, Phil is on the co-host doing well, Buzz, unfortunately. So, you know, yin and yang. <laughs> yeah, well, everyone I talk to here is quite optimistic. Like, I'm either getting we're absolutely going to hammer them and it's going to be the greatest day in Irish history, which tends to be from the people who've probably been out and about for a bit longer today yeah. than others. And then the more conservative crowd would say a draw. Oh, I've heard a lot of 1-1 one -one draws. So, yeah, that that'll be good I mean we definitely take it at this stage be happy days um, 
yeah, it's just, I mean, fair play to FIFA and like the Australia organizing committee for putting on everything that they have here tonight. It's really well set up. There's loads of food stalls, there's music, the bars are hopping. Like there's just a really good atmosphere around the place and it really feels like a major tournament. And can you feel the surge of Irish fans towards the game? Because we, we, you know, we're, we're all dying to see now exactly how much green there is when we get in there. Yeah, you definitely can feel the surge. So they're on the other side of the stadium where I came from to you guys from earlier. The That's where the train station is. And train takes quite a while actually to get out here. It's like over an hour. And you can just see that like every time a train comes in, there's just a surge and like definitely strong Irish representation in it. I saw um, someone had a picture up of Surrey Hills there as well, which is actually where I've been staying the last couple of days. There's an Irish bar there, Molly Malone's, and the street, is they've had to close off the street because it's so packed with Irish people. So it's not just here that it's being felt. It seems like it's across Sydney, which is great to see. Kathleen, we let you go and take your seat and um, best of luck. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I actually, sorry, before you go, I had one guy come up to me and he was like, can I come on off the ball? Owen Sheen absolutely didn't need jersey during the Japan World Cup and I want to get my revenge. And uh, then he chickened out. So, Owen, you lost me an interview. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, it, you know, if yeah. This is one of those long running things. He can, uh, he can get you the next game, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we can dig out the dirty bit and like uh, remind him. Well, that's of... the thing. The friends wouldn't even tell me what actually happened. So I, I'm curious now. I'm going to have to get on to Take a, take a photograph next time you see him and we can uh, compare and contrast. Kathleen, good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. Thanks, guys. So, what are we? Uh, 19 minutes past nine, kick off to 11. It's uh, New Zealand 1, Norway 0. An hour gone in that game. Yeah, and you know you can see that Norway are up in the tempo, but they just they haven't been very fluid in attack and New Zealand are just uh, had a set piece there. And as I said, in the first half, although Norway had a lot of possession, that ball over the top just seemed to cause a bit of uh, panic in the, the Norway defence. And, uh, you know, th- these are former champions, but you think back to the Euros, they got hockeyed 8 0 by England. Yeah, that doesn't uh, make any sense, does it? No, no. And, you know, this was an England team that, again, kind of going back to being a host nation, their first game, was they all, they it? beat Austria 1 0. Right. And I was actually thinking about this as well. Maybe Australia a bit, bit like that, where. You know, it takes them a while to get going. I'm fascinated to see how both sets of players cope with this eighty thousand. Well, because we were talking with Cathy Freeman, right? And actually, we were we've been talking with Cathy Freeman for a couple of weeks, and how that seems to be the Australian sports culture is that you step up and you you embrace the challenge and everything. But the pressure that Cathy Freeman was under was unbelievable. Yeah, and she performed. But like, it's it's a unicorn moment in. Australian sports history because she performed under such pressure yeah now she's come into the team this week and been like I did this Sam Kerr's like oh I was totally in awe well, that's good it's, you should be in awe right yeah but what if you're in awe to like oh no I'm going to be letting Cathy Freeman down here that's what I'm saying yeah I, I, I just feel with Australian teams I've seen it in the past even at Rugby World Cups where there's not much talk about them and all of a sudden they land themselves in a semi-final they tend to embrace these events there's always a fluky win along the way where like the referee does them does Scotland dirty against them yeah. or whatever do you know like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. never quite the straightforward we're just going to battery it unless like the, obviously the torpedo was pretty good at that uh, when he was at his peak yeah he wasn't bad now the thing is the way Ireland set up yeah, I'm, I'm looking more Nick Kyrgios here you know uh, just, it's going to take him a little while to get going but could also go horribly wrong That that is the hope um, but <laughs> sorry to all our Australian viewers by the way this is uh, this is shocking behaviour on our part but no look I mean I'm sure the exact same thing is going on on the airwaves in Australia yeah. Yeah. where they're just basically expecting to turn up there's going to be a party and then they win and they party on into the night and then they're like oh who are we playing next yeah. and then they get to the last 16 and all of a sudden they start thinking about maybe we could win this whole yeah. thing yeah um, that's kind of what they're thinking and they must be thinking that because like they have a really high quality team yeah. and it's a World Cup so anything can happen this has been an absolutely world class save from the Norway goalkeeper to keep the score at 1-0 after an hour of that game so New Zealand really grown into it yeah the, the goal has obviously given them confidence but it just gives them something to hold on to and that is my hope for the game in Sydney that if we could score first you know you kind of think back to the, the campaign where those big results we got the the away game in Finland the away game in Sweden we scored first in those games and then you know 
obviously we, we almost held out against Sweden we got pegged back against Finland but we, we found a, a, a way to win that night so actually just watching the, the programme last night the documentary and you kind of remember some of those um, twists and turns and um, Kathleen mentioned Rihanna Jarrett who's over there she's obviously not in the squad but she had a she had a key role in a couple of those games earlier in the campaign as well but yeah it's um, I, I just think you know it's really going to hit home when the players walk out onto the pitch and I know they've left now they've left the, the team hotel and Rusha Littlejohn was talking about the, the nerves in the camp and actually it's quite relaxed but she said herself maybe when she's on the bus it's going to be it's going to be a big deal where they're like wow we're actually on our way and when they see all the fans are in the stadium we talked to Luke Connolly Megan Connolly's brother who is a footballer for Cork has played in many big games himself over mm. the years and takes he a said, good penalty I wonder if we get a penalty would Megan Connolly take the penalty she might who now Katie McKay missed a few for Arsenal so I also am haunted by the sound of that crossbar in that Ukraine game they okay. played it last night in the documentary and they actually put in like they really emphasised the, the thud off the crossbar and Katie McCabe talked about how you know she could still hear that sound she could but um, I would still imagine as the captain she'd step up if we got a penalty yeah yeah uh, did Robbie uh, oh Ian Hart missed the penalty in normal time and then Robbie took the penalty yeah, yeah. Um, sorry but uh, Luke Connolly anyway I just remember Luke Connolly scored an unbelievable penalty for Cork and Megan tweeted going I've taught him well his point was that they were very stressed and she was very relaxed when mm. they were getting the tickets from her this morning so fingers crossed that's how the rest of the squad are feeling as well obviously there's been a few hours in between for yeah. them to ratchet things up um, I just want to briefly mention the FAI haven't tweeted the team just yet uh, but they have tweeted a message from Irish sports legends the first minute and a half is Katie Taylor and then there's five seconds of Roy Keane going, well, oh, best of luck. It's a full minute and a half. Katie going, yeah, best of luck. This is amazing. It's incredible. Very proud of you. And then it's just Roy looking a little bit like, oh, oh, somebody's made me do this. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> is he actually got the phone himself? See, no, it could be. I was going to say it could be a case of, you, you know, when you're trying to multitask and you're making sure you're looking at the right thing and you don't really know what you're saying it's one of his kids I'd say okay uh, and then we have Rachel Blackmore and we have Annalise uh, Rachel Blackmore's had a good couple of weeks um, hanging out in the Royal Box and then Seamus Coleman Seamus Coleman come across really well yeah. in the um, Players Tribune piece that Katie Taylor Katie Taylor Katie McCabe did during the week as well uh, just a, one of the key leaders in Irish football yeah absolutely and you know the obviously the follow on from the Liberty Hall in 2017 and then the equal pay and yeah but we all know I mean we know how like what a gent Seamus Coleman is and like, there's a reason that he's been at Everton for so long and yeah y you know we, we, we feel that he obviously will have some sort of coaching role when he decides to hang up the boots to be just is one of those people that uh has great leadership qualities Frank yeah. Frank Lampard described him as one of the greatest men he's ever met yeah do you hope uh, this is obviously a mad tangent do you hope that he like takes his time to get into coaching and, and, and has it like, or, or do you like stick him in immediately involved at some level an international level with Ireland and in a leadership role with the FAI like is that because he could you know he could do anything in the organisation I wonder is his priority though just with Everton that maybe that's where he starts and then back with the team uh, there look, for a couple of years. I mean you can you can mix you can mix them you can yeah. you could do both you could um, be part of yeah. a coaching setup at underage but um, yeah no, I, I've, I've no doubt given his personality and his temperament that he, he has a bright future when he does hang up the boots as well but in terms of Katie Taylor obviously would have played with some of these players and um, yeah no it's it's just a, 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 when you see them walking out now, it's going to be a really proud moment, and I think it'll it'll really hit home. Just the the journey, and even just you know, you think back to that disappointment in Ukraine. I just remember Vera Pau was so defiant that this will not happen again, and we'll qualify for the World Cup. And then you saw the group, and you're like, yeah, maybe you were a bit premature with that, but here they are. Here they are, and. It just, you know, it, it, it was meant to be. You think of the, the penalty save from, from Courtney Brosnan and, you know, that's Caroline Weir who is a quality player and Courtney Brosnan saves it. And obviously we know what happens with Amber Barrett. I think Amber Barrett could have a say today. Um, you know, she 
she always fancies a goal when she comes on so that uh, I, I would imagine she's not starting I mean the team pretty much picks itself and so we mentioned Connolly I would imagine Connolly's going to be part of a back three yeah um, and then obviously that means Rusha Little John's going to be in midfield I know Lily Ag was talked about earlier in the the week when you were talking to Maeve de Burke she was talking about Lily Ag and Amber Barrett are kind of your, your two expected subs I would yeah. say uh, still no team officially named as soon as it happens we'll uh, put it up on all of our social channels uh, you're, you're concerned rightly about the quality of this Australia side so we need to be realistic here um, everybody does love a bandwagon but the mm. bandwagon doesn't always get cranked into gear no. in the first game no and as I said it's such a, a hard first game and I know people have been talking about Euro 2012 because they've just been trying to compare like how tough a group that was and everyone looked at that Croatia game and thought you know if we get something from this we're in it but the thing is if, if we don't get anything from this game then you're going up against the Olympic champions now yeah. we don't really know what to expect from Canada they've had a few issues off the field has that affected their preparation and then you know you, you go into the last game against Nigeria who are one of the best teams in Africa so but at that stage we'll know what to expect from them but also that's the third game in the group and I know Vera Pau doesn't like to make too many changes but I can't see how you can pick the same 11 for three team, for three games in the space of 10 days I don't I just don't if you want to play at a certain ten, uh, intensity now the way we do play in terms of we are going to sit in it's not as we're playing a high press kind of uh, heavy metal football yeah. but you still need to, if you're sitting deep, you still need runners to cause problems on the break. So, yeah, it's, um, I, yeah, like it's an exciting nervousness I have where, yeah, you can't believe we're about to play at a World Cup. But then when the game kicks off, everything, all those bad things that go on in your head where you think of everything that could go wrong, that's... Yeah, that's what goes through my head. Yeah, well, that's uh, the life of a football fan. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the golf is underway. Um, there's a bunch of players on two under par through nine or ten holes. Alex McGuire, the amateur, is even par through with first eight holes mm. of the Open. And we also have um, Larry Harrington and Seamus Power in action in the next hour or so. Yeah, Darren Clark's out on the course as well. Obviously, 2011 winner. He, when I was coming in, he had got back to one over. He had dropped a couple of early shots. McGuire had actually he dropped an early shot as well but he, he got back so Larry and uh, sorry Harrington and Power have just teed off yeah. and then Larry goes out at 10 past 10 and then McElroy's out just before 3 o'clock yeah so a long a long day of waiting for oh like the, the net, like with a World Cup starting we've got the Open we've an All-Ireland hurling final yeah it's unbelievable what to watch New Zealand won Norway nil 71 minutes gone in the clock and that one Ashley O'Reilly is on her way down to uh, Cork as well we'll bring you some material she's she's at a watch along with a family I think you probably guess which one um, and so uh, she'll be uh, on tomorrow with Shane here on Off the Ball AM Sports Breakfast Show from OTB give me your prediction I'll go with the optimistic one all that you know Australia score first there's a great buzz about the place they think they're going to win and then no, we just don't. they don't get the second goal and then Louise Quinn gets the equaliser for us we would take that for sure absolutely I would, that, that would be a, a, a great result um, and I said it would set us up that even if it gives you a little bit of wiggle room with the Canada game then yeah I should mention tonight in the Borgosh Energy Theatre the hurling pod is live in association with BGE uh, but all of the funds raised are going to the Dylan Quirk Foundation and to Focus Ireland so it's for an incredible cause the lineup is also absolutely sensational uh, Tommy Walsh is going to join us in studio having been on stage uh, tonight um, they also have Joe Canning they obviously have the Hurling Pod lads and more so if you've any interest in wetting your appetite for the All Ireland Final this weekend make sure you get along to the BGE this evening I suspect there's like a handful of tickets left for that one on the way we're going to play some Fan Larkin and Joe Hennessy goodness speaking with Shane Hannon as I said Tommy Walsh in studio tomorrow all the reaction to uh, Ireland and Australia as well right now though something special to play out Deck Pierce and Block Rock and Beats have released a World Cup song here is the Koi Gig song enjoy the game come on Ireland
this coming weekend, Kilkenny against Limerick, and we're at the uh, the esteemed and the famous pitches of James Stevens, the Village Club here in Kilkenny City. Uh, delighted to be joined by two absolute legends of both the club and county. I think it's fair to say, Joe Hennessy beside me and Van Larkin on the far end. Lads, how are you keeping? Very good, Shane. Thank you very much. Oh, we're not too bad. We're still above ground. <laughs> well, that's the place to be. That's the place to be. Uh, you lads would have played with each other, presumably for a number of years at least. Oh yes. We started in 1996, 95 we said, 1995, senior, didn't we, John? We'll get the maybe, calculators out here, will we? Maybe 85, man. I would it? We'll go back another 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, around 85, yeah. We, yeah, yeah. we had a nice bit of success in the club and uh, won a few county titles and uh, two club all Now so The club has three, but the seventh of won, won two in the 80s there. What is the club? 76 cl- and 81, sorry. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, you, were, you were close enough there, lads. You, were, yeah, you took, you took your, your time to get to the numbers, but we got there. Uh, the, the club itself, like the village, I suppose when you're driving around Kilkenny you hear the esteemed stories of the village club and, and all the players that have passed through um, it must mean a lot to the both of you this pitch and the memories you have here as well yeah that's true Shane yeah I've gone back over the years and um, like success was scarce enough back then you know it took 90 I suppose fan played in the 69 county final and uh, that set the foundation for all the young lads like myself coming on after and when they made the breakthrough in 69 we came on and won a club all earned after and another one and all the other young lads came on fan son and all Brian McAvoy and all those they came on and won another one so we hand it's a kind of a you hand over it's like the hand over for the baton yeah uh, that 69 final must uh, must have been a special one well, for you it was it was the first one they won since 1937 or 35 we said that was the first senior championship they won my father was on that and uh, they won another one in 30 37 and they didn't win another one then till 69 they won a junior one in 54 but that was the start of it then from there on I, I presumably back then as well it, 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 it was I guess club level even today is, is so professional in the way in all but but payment I suppose but but back then it was a little bit different you could probably enjoy yourselves and, and, and have a little bit of fun in between matches you'd imagine as well yeah well the fun even we hurling with Kilkenny we always give what the lads are giving now and we trained every bit as hard but we all enjoyed it I mean if I wanted to go to have a pint of a Saturday night before in all Ireland I could go down and drink one or two you know, and then no one be any the wiser. Or well, someone, I think someone was it you, Joe, talking about Frank Cummins before? I remember you talking about he worked in um, in demolition, and even the night before in All Ireland, he was he was down in Cork working. That's right, yeah. I remember the, the, speaking to him the night after that night we won the eighty two final against Cork. Fan was a selector oh. the same day, and we were Cork were red hot. But anyway. I was having a bit of a chat with Frank and he said he was up on the wall it got down off at 5 to 12 the night before the 82 all Ireland final he had a job to do and it had to be done at a certain time down in Cork mm-hmm. and that's the way it was then you worked and you played but like Fran said he could have a pint I didn't drink but I remember going down to the likes of Kittler is in or the Carlton Ballroom here Tin Lizzy could be playing whoever and you go down and see him no problem of a Saturday evening you go over to the park and play with Kilkenny in the league match on a Sunday but that was no problem but like it's his gone as fans said it's his gone professional now And but you'd, you'd play and you'll get home with the, whatever the occasion whatever the time span you're in and that's the way it is it's funny isn't it how, how much it's changed over the years because like, that 82 final you talk about you say Cork were favourites they were very heavy favourites weren't they and, and that was a, that was one of the the greatest all Ireland. Not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say greatest all Ireland upsets because that would be unfair in yourselves because I'm sure you went into it fancying yourselves but certainly the outsiders thought it was Cork's yeah well Cork I was at the Munster final they beat Watford by 39 points in Turles and you know most people said that, that team and won't be beaten but you see when they come up to Crow Park it's a different atmosphere and Kilkenny as fan will tell you Kilkenny loved Crow Park mm-hmm. and they're a different animal when they go in there maybe the teams that come up out of Munster mightn't be as comfortable in Crow I don't know what it is but on all Ireland final day is a great leveller yeah but you see Kilkenny that day see that team won two national leagues well they won three national leagues because they came up from second division and two all Irelands and no no one but the lads over them we had we had a great team that time all them lads won under 21 medals and minor medals I mean they weren't new to the game you know to win the minor all Ireland in Kilkenny or an under 21 you're on a stepping stone, you know, and it's very competitive here. It's like the lads today now. The lads are playing next Sunday. Most of them have underage medals, you know. They're not, they're not new to it, you know. 
they're used to winning I suppose from, from, from under age up yeah well that's the name of the game they're used to winning and the lads before them won it and when they pass on the baton there will be lads coming to take it up you know do, do, we, do both of you have do both of you respectively remember getting the call up to the to the Kilkenny team for the first time because obviously you would have played minor and at 21s as it was back then as well but but that first call up to the senior team in the black and amber must have been a pinch me moment yeah I got a, I got a call up after we win a club all Ireland and the lads were after winning the 75 the fan was playing cornerback against Galway in the 75 all Ireland but they had been out to America and you know the way some lads retire or whatever and there was an opening and I was must be next on the list and God rest him Paddy Grace rang me one night and I couldn't but you know what I mean it was delighted to get a call up because you know you're hurling with all the lads there you're watching these lads winning all Ireland so every young lad in Kilkenny wants to win one all Ireland anyway you know it's a badge of honour it's nice to walk around the street you see a lad and you say he's going to win an all Ireland or he hasn't got one and you hope that the day will come when the people that you know lads you in the club here and all the old clubs you'd love to see a lad win the first all Ireland mm. which is a great call up to get well, the first time I was called up, it's well before year time, I was called up of a Wednesday night. We were playing Tipperary in the league match, and they were after being beaten again Dublin, the, the follow, or Wexford, above in Dublin the, the week before. And I got 